Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the regular business meeting for the District of Squamish uh, for today, December 6th. Um, and as always, um, welcome to the Squamish Nation Traditional Territory. Uh, could I have uh, someone move adoption of the agenda, please? Moved by Councillor French, second by Councillor Anderson. All in favor? Motion carries. Um, we, uh, we have nothing under the delegations, petitions, proclamations category. Uh, so on to item four, which would be consideration of unscheduled public attendance. Yes, come on forward. So, so this is your opportunity to, um, to make the case why your, your matter uh, first should be heard by council and secondly should be heard in, uh, in a timely fashion and can't wait until uh, our next regular meeting in, in two weeks. So um, I'll turn it over to you. If you could start by stating your name and address or neighborhood, uh, and you have um, five minutes to, five minutes seems like a long time. You have five minutes to address council on this, uh, on why you need to speak tonight is the bit, not the, yeah. So okay. specific to that, which is hard for us to break those two things apart as well, but that's what we're doing. So over to you. Uh, hi there, everyone. My name is Alice Collins. I um, am a resident of the main building, so number 517-37881 Cleveland Avenue. So the reason I'm requesting to speak to the council tonight is that agenda item 10A is uh, in regard to a motion to address the current utilities billing issue um, with regard to the main building. Um, there are approximately 96 residents within that building that received a utility bill in September of this year, very much to our surprise. Um, and we believe that this issue uh, needs to be addressed tonight as there is an agenda item tonight to move a motion to continue to pursue this bill. Thank you very much. Um, Council, do we have any, any questions on, on that or can we proceed to a vote? So, um, Go ahead. I'll move that we hear from Ms. Collins under number 19, unscheduled public attendance. Uh, before we get a seconder on that, um, I'd rather just, if you could make a, a motion that just says that we would hear from, uh, that'll give uh, me room to adjust where that is appropriately, which I think should be conjoined with the issue they're trying to speak to in some way. So I agree. Friendly amendment. Thank you. In that case, I will, uh, I'll second that so that we, we agreed to, to hear from from Ms. Collins uh, in this evening's um, in this evening's meeting. Um, with that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. Nope. Motion carries. Thank you. And um, I'll figure out how that all fits together uh, shortly. Um, item five. We know have no public hearings, um, but we're on to item six, which is the scheduled. Items so under community planning and infrastructure item one uh, council reconsideration of director decision to refuse temporary use permit and we have staff here to to present and council so you're aware um, we're going to have a presentation from staff and then the proponents going to make a presentation as well and then we'll have a and then we'll have a, a our conversation after that so after staff presents we'll have an opportunity for clarifying questions if needed. And um, and same with the, uh, the the proponent, although it's questions of clarity. I'll go over that again. I will turn it over to staff to take us through this. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Gary Buxton, General Manager of Community Planning and Sustainability. Just a brief introduction before uh, my colleagues get into the uh, into the presentation on the on the the detailed content. Um, we're here to review the decision that was delegated to the Director of Community Planning. It's actually very rare. This is twice in my tenure of eight years here at the, at the district. So um, it's essentially an adjudication function. It's not council's legislated function. We're, we're administering policy that's already in existence. We're not creating or reviewing policy. We're asking what's the decision of the director consistent with that policy? In this case, the zoning bylaw and any, any direction contained in the OCP. The application and the policy that, that we have are frozen in time as of the date of the, the date of the application and the date of the decision. Um, we can't move either, um, firstly, because of certainty for both 
the the applicant and um, and staff. Um, there needs to be certainty that the policy in place is being administered. Um, the analogy is you sort of a hockey analogy. You can't move the goals to where the shot is going and you can't move the goals to avoid the shot. Once the shot is taken, the application is made. In this case, then everything stays where it is. So we're here to administer policy and review the application as submitted. Um, a basic summary of the issues at hand. Any development must comply with the uses that are outlined in the relevant section of the zoning bylaw, in which case the I-8 zone. If it doesn't comply, then it cannot be permitted. What we have here is a use that doesn't neatly fit into one of those permitted uses. It does partially fit light industrial. Um, some elements don't fit that definition. Um, those elements do fit neatly with, or do fit partially with other uses that are not permitted in the I-8 zone too. Um, so not all applications neatly fit into the definitions the most significant contention I think that we're going to deal with is whether the contested elements in the application fit within the definition of indoor recreation. Staff's decision is that it does not. Um, the applicant contests that the elements do, and that forms the heart of the problem that Council is going to have to wrestle with. Um, Mr. Daly will give um, much more background on those details. The TUP process that we have here is the only process that we have to resolve these when we have these disputed definitions contained in the zoning bylaw. So that, that's why we're here um, tonight. And just further, with respect to the staff recommendations, um, yes, there were other staff in the department, in, in the organization that have been in contact with the, with the applicant, um, particularly in the economic development staff. Uh, and that department, yes, they their role is to facilitate and encourage new business. Uh, and they did that in their part in, in taking part of this application. <clears throat> However, the issue is an application and interpretation of the zoning bylaw. To that effect, community planning staff have prepared the report. Um, that's the only recommendation that's coming from staff tonight on this application. So that's the background. And I'll now turn it over to Mr. Daly to give you the more pertinent details. Thank you, Mr. Buxton. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Brian Daly, Planner with Community Planning, and I am here tonight to present a reconsideration of a director decision to refuse temporary use permit number 33. Section 493 of the Local Government Act allows for Council to dele delegate the authority to issue a TUP to staff with the provision that the owner of the land that is subject to the decision of the delegate is entitled to have Council reconsider the matter. Section 10 of the Land Development Procedures Bylaw allows for TUPs with a development proposal of up to 300 square meters to be considered by the Director of Community Planning. And Section 19 outlines the procedures for Council to reconsider the di Director decisions. The owners of Happy Mess have submitted a delegated TUP application to allow for what staff has determined to be assembly use at Unit 120 39455 Discovery Way that was reviewed by staff and subsequently denied on October 19th, 2022. The owners have requested the Council reconsider the staff decision. A temporary use permit may be issued for a period of no more than three years and then one subsequent renewal of no more than three additional years may follow. Ultimate resolution of these issues requires an amendment to the zoning bylaw. A decision rendered with respect to this application will therefore only apply temporarily. The subject property is located at 39455 Discovery Way and zoned Specialized Industrial Business I-8. Properties to the north are designated industrial and are currently zoned Residential 2. Properties to the east are zoned Specialized Highway Commercial C-9 and Adventure Highway Commercial C-11. The property immediately south is zoned Specialized Business Service Center I-9 and the remaining properties to the south and west are also zoned I-8. The land use designation for the property is industrial employment. Development permit number 545 was issued on June 8, 2021, which permitted two multi-bay light industrial buildings on the subject property. The buildings are currently under construction and the applicant is intending to be a tenant in one of the buildings once completed. The zoning bylaw provides the following definitions of assembly, light industrial, and indoor recreation. As noted in the definition of indoor recreation, the use associated with the recreational activities that require warehouse type, type space. 
with high ceilings that is typically found in industrial buildings. Examples would be a climbing gym or the business airhouse. Storage of materials does not classify as requiring warehouse type space for in indoor recreation and would be associated with light industrial use. Staff have determined that providing recreational art activities would best fall under assembly use, which is not permitted in the I-8 zone. Staff apply a more rigid interpretation of these definitions in the business park, as there is limited supply of land zoned for predominantly light industrial businesses and high demand for the space. There are zones that allow for both assembly and indoor recreation and include C11 and MUD2. This use also fits in neighborhood commercial definitions. Neighborhood commercial and small scale manufacturing is permitted in the MUD1 zone and production of art or art materials would also be allowed in any zone that allows for artisan use. The applicants have applied for a temporary use permit to allow for recreational art activities and offer alternatives to childcare as noted on their application. Um, the intention of this TUP request is to facilitate a multi-use floor plan that interchanges between artisan activities, sensory play, and manufacturing. Manufacturing would be permitted under the light industrial use, which is allowed in I-8. And as mentioned previously, staff have determined that providing recreational art activities and sensory play would best fall under assembly use, which is not permitted in I-8. The district's employment space and industrial land use related policies do not support expansion of assembly activity in certain areas of the business park. Remaining land within the business park is intended for high employment density land uses in the light industrial, knowledge base, high tech and rec tech fields and craft beverage manufacturing. District policy also speaks to the need to protect the industrial land base from encroachment of incompatible land uses. Following objectives and policies shown on this slide from the OCP do not support approval of an assembly use on industrial lands. The development approved under development permit 545 considered two multi-bay industrial buildings. The development layout is typical for light industrial sites and does not accommodate pickup and drop off space design that would be desired for providing a use that the owners have described as an alternative for childcare. As previously noted, assembly is not per a permitted use in the I-8 zone and has a parking requirement of one space per five seats or 11 spaces per 100 square meters of floor area used by the public, which is a much higher parking requirement than those contemplated during development permit 545 site planning. The floor plan provided by the applicant suggests that only 27 square meters of the ground floor will be used for assembly use for nine hours per day. However, there are no partitions on the ground floor separating the manufacturing and assembly areas. This is a concern as it would be challenging to practically contain the assembly use for the majority of the day, which would require 11 parking stalls as per the zoning bylaw. The proposed site plan does not appear to have con considered attributing this number of parking spaces to one single unit, which may have a negative impact on adjacent tenants. So council has the op option to affirm the decision of the director, which is staff's recommendation, or to replace the decision with an approval of council's choice with or without conditions. Any approval must specify a time period of no more than three years. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions at this time. Thank you. <clears throat> council, um, we are gonna hear from the proponent next. So if, there, if you have any before we do that, if you have any clarifying questions for staff, this would be the, the time. Uh, yes, Councillor Penningham. Um, so I think <clears throat> we have heard that not all businesses fit neatly within existing zoning. A temporary use permit therefore allows on a temporary basis, a use not um, permitted by an existing zone. Um, just for clarity, what policy guides whether or not a temporary use that's not consistent with zoning makes sense because obviously you know we sort of acknowledge that the zone doesn't permit the uses but maybe we temporarily allow something outside of the zone so what what policy sort of allows us to decide of, of whether or not those temporary uses make sense now through the mayor that would be the official community plan so the relevant policies associated with that land use designation for whatever zoning and land use designation is in place, uh, you'd review the relevant policies and base the decision on that. Thank you, Councillor Greenlaw. Uh, I just had a question about um, the assemblies. What, what number of people are you expecting to, in order to categorize it as an assembly? 
uh, through the mayor, it's not necessarily uh, associated with the number of people uh, doing the use. Um, the definition of assembly means a use which provides for the assembly of persons for religious, charitable, philanthropic, cultural, recreational, or educational purposes. So that's a rather broad definition. And the fact that it's speaking to recreational purposes was why staff thought that that was an appropriate use, um, given that it was not the most common um, business. Yeah, I was mostly just curious because if there's a requirement for 11 parking spots, clearly there's an expectation of numerous people attending, correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, I believe the intention behind that is because it is, it, there would be, a, yes, a number of people uh, for any of the various reasons noted in the definition. Thanks. Councillor Stoner, go ahead. Thank you. I'm wondering if staff can provide, a, provide an example of an existing business or space that would be zoned as assembly. So I know the li I think the library is one example. Do you have an example of a business that is zoned as assembly? Uh, through the mayor, I don't have a specific business. I know a number of zones do permit assembly. Um, for example, C11, MUD2, um, P1, P2, P3, UH1, C4, CD34, a number of the CD zones, uh, especially the ones downtown, um, these are the all of these zones do permit assembly. I don't have an example uh, right in front of me of a of, of a specific business that would fall under that use. So maybe I will pass it to my director. Um, through you, Chair uh, Jonas Volnishki, is director of community planning. Um, I think we'd have to review business license data because that's where this sort of information gets captured. What use gets categorized when we approve business licensing, which is when we do, you know, a lot of the interpretations of how a particular business uh, fits in a zone. Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, my other question was just about uh, the definition of indoor recreation. I just wonder if staff can reiterate why they don't think that the applicants proposed activities fit under indoor recreation. Through the mayor. Um, so the, as noted in the definition, it require activities that require warehouse type space and may include climbing walls and adventure centers. Um, so staff specifically in the business park as well, have taken the interpretation that that use would require the high ceilings typically associated with industrial buildings. For example, um, in the I-8 zone, there is the climbing gym, which obviously requires a very tall ceiling, and the airhouse business, which is a trampoline um, recreational facility that also requires high ceilings. So staff have used the, the taller ceiling heights as one of the typical uh, criteria for associating that with allowing it in these industrial zones. Um, noting that there is a high demand for this type of space and wanting to make sure that as much of it as possible is preserved for in light industrial businesses. Yeah, fair enough. I guess I'm curious about the nature of this business is quite messy. So yeah, they talk about warehousing, large canvas space, but it's also, it's, it's a it's a messy business by nature. And so I'm curious if the nature of the business has any sort of bearing on how we consider indoor recreation, or is it really just the height of the building? Uh, through the mayor, no, we have been taking the interpretation of the ceiling height in the business park associated with this definition. Thank you, that's it for now, Chair. Thank you, I have Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. I've got two questions. Um, the first is uh, a few times we mentioned child care, and I just want to be, I want to clearly understand what that means here in this context. Um, do the business owners have a child care license and are they running a daycare or is this place where parents can, you know, after school, you have a, a few hours of activity for your kids type child care. Can you speak to the nature of child care? Uh, through the mayor, uh, it might be best if the applicant speaks to that when they have their opportunity to. I don't believe they have a child care license. Uh, staff uh, are mentioning child care as that what was uh, provided on the application form, uh, but I don't believe there is a child care license. 
Thanks very much. And my second question is, um, you've, you've given us a few examples of indoor recreation facilities that require tall ceiling heights in the I-8 zone. Do you have any examples of indoor recreation facilities that do not require high ceiling heights that are active in the I-8 zone? Uh, through the mayor, I do not have an example of that. Uh, the two businesses that I believe are under indoor rec are um, the Climbing Gym and Air House. There is a, I believe, a karate studio, but that was uh, approved under a fitness center, which is also a permitted use in I-8. Thank you. Okay, Council, we're going to have another... Uh, I think that's good for this round of questions. At this time, I'll invite the proponent to come up and uh, address council. And uh, you can both go if you'd, if you'd like. And your mic's on and you're ready to go. So maybe start by uh, uh, welcome, but st start with stating your, uh, your, your name and then you have five minutes to, to address council go a little long if we need, but we'll try to hold it to five minutes. My name is Marcus Monopoly, and this is my wife, Dalia Shahata. We own Happy Mess, and we'd like to thank you for allowing us uh, to present today. Uh, Happy Mess is a sensory play area and art studio looking to expand our business to include manufacturing. We want to create at-home art kits and crafts, <clears throat> like an online subscription service types of business model. We did this during the pandemic, and it's how our business survived. We are looking to move into the business park to capitalize on this idea and for it to become our main source of revenue. This new business line is scalable and will provide multiple jobs in our community. Here's a breakdown of why we should be granted a TUP for your consideration. The TUP is the only option that would let us move forward in a timeline that would allow Happy Mess to grow and expand while allowing council time to consider why we fit in the IA zone as is and let us sign a rental agreement to secure our space. Our new business venture is flexible. We've made that clear with planning and we've adapted our business floor plan to align with the IA criteria and not under a stability. <clears throat> when corresponding with planning, with corresponding with the planning department, they acknowledged our business requires warehouse type space and that it is similar to other recreational activities. They also required that 50% of our floor plan had to be geared toward manufacturing. We adhered to that criteria so we may be classified as industrial use with accessory events and classes and not assembly. Our manufacturing will occupy more than 60% of our new space and 100% when there are no classes running. Second point, we believe that our business fits under the bylaw as is. Granting Happy Mess a TUP would not require an amendment to the bylaw, but rather a shift in interpretation of the current bylaw with a more inclusive lens. And there are no budgetary or organizational implication if Happy Mess is granted a TUP. Section 39A, which is the industrial business IA zone, the intent of this zone is to permit development of an industrial, industrial business park containing a mix of light industrial uses, using technology and research and development activity, including rec tech, as well as ancillary limited office and service uses, services uses undertaken in enclosed buildings having high standard of design. Now, of course, under permanent, permanent uses, we have light industrial, which they've already met, we fit. And of course, we're arguing over or the, the indoor, recreation portion of the bylaw. Indoor recreation means the use of a building for indoor recreational activities that require warehouse type space and may include climbing walls and adventure centers, but specifically excludes arcades. The bylaw mentions that the definition may include, and so defining indoor recreation as strictly a physical activity. And if you, dress, if you just make it uh, indoor recreation as strictly a physical activity, that is unconsciously ableist. Happy Mess caters to people of all abilities and was founded on principles of equity and accessibility. There are other similar businesses that do not have a manufacturing component allowed in the I-8 zone. They are not being interpreted as assembly or childcare simply because they provide physical activities. There needs to be some flexibility in the interpretation of the bylaw to include art under indoor recreation. In this co collective review process with the DOS on our business use, it's clear that we straddle more than one zone and we hope the district will constructively apply zoning bylaws to support a local business. Our classes operate less than 25% of the time and are far from the precedent setting and far from precedent setting when compared to higher occupancy assembly uses like churches, etc. By simply allowing art use under indoor recreation, the district runs little risk of setting a precedent that impacts other uses. Now, with all that, 
all that in mind, we'd like to highlight that Happy Mess will create several employment opportunities and therefore keeping with the objectives of the OCP, section 17.1a, 17.2a, 17.2d, 17.3a, 17.4a, and 17.4c. The report also has also, the report by the district has also mentioned concern over conflict between Happy Mess use and services provided to young children and the allowed industrial uses in the I-8 zone. But no such concern is raised if a trampoline park, dance center, martial arts facility, or similar businesses apply for the use of the space. And that makes the rule inequitable. The same goes for parking requirements, although we would like to point out that our business currently only has two parking spaces assigned to it, and we've been operating six years with no issues downtown. Our class pickup times are staggered in nature, and parents pick up at different times, unlike dance studios and gyms. We value the art we create and our classes are inclusive in nature to make it accessible for everyone, including neurodivergent people and those with learning disabilities. Our class sizes will continue to stay small, regardless of how much space we have. As planning staff have pointed out, we have no partitions in our floor plan. So what's stopping us from running, running large classes is the fact that we cater to these people. And simple, easels. Having three rows of easels, you don't see anything. You have a big easel in front of you, you can't really work with, <laughs> with all Can I also work? add easels? If I, if I brought my easel with one of my canvases, a ceiling like this could not handle it. So when you put a large canvas on an easel, the bar in the back goes all the way up and it requires higher ceilings, obviously not as high as a climbing gym, but it does not fit in retail space. The retail space we have right now, we're lucky to have higher ceiling in there, but even then I hit the lights consistently. I've broken three lights at Happy Mess with my easel. So, so and our third point, hold on, when, um, we, we've gone, we're time? a little a little over, but I'll, get, I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to sort of uh, tie right. it together and then we'll move on to so our, our questions. So you want to submit that we're an indoor recreation center and a light industrial manufacturing facility therefore oper able to operate in the I-8, and we're asking for a TUP that permits for that use, not for assembly use, as it is not supported in the zone, nor the developer will allow it. This resolution will not be a solution to our issue, so please consider that if you support our request. Thank you. Can I quickly add answers to the questions that were asked by council? Um, I believe uh, Mr. Hamilton asked if we are childcare. We're not a childcare facility. We're not licensed. We do not get the subsidies that are provided under licensing, and they don't want us. We checked. Um, the childcare alternative is providing classes of single use focus, and that is exactly what we provide. And that falls under its own criteria and it has nothing to do with childcare as a childcare facility. Uh, the other example uh, to Ms. Stoner's question of uh, businesses that are allowed at an indoor recreation without a need for, for high ceilings would be dance centers. You do not require a high ceiling for dancing, but that is a permitted use. And again, it's a physical activity. Um, so, and high ceilings are not the only determining factor of warehouse use. So simply saying that businesses that don't require a high ceiling can go anywhere that is not warehouse, we do and have proved why we need warehouse space. And staff in their correspondence with us in the initial response was, yes, you do require, we admit that you require warehouse space. And yes, we, like you are recreation and similar to other businesses. The only difference is the physical activity aspect. Uh, I would like to also point out that MUD 2 and C4 are not accessible in our town. They, uh, there's like one space that's zoned MUD 2 that's available in the entire town right now, and it's not affordable at all. <laughs> like if you if you're want the businesses to grow and be able to afford staff, there, there's no way we can provide employment and pay rent. So. Okay. Thank you very much for your for your submission. Um, Council, any clarifying, I want to stress this, is clarifying questions for the proponent while we, while we have them here. Um, Council, Councilor Greenlaw? Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, in this new space, in this new business plan, will you still be providing Pro D Day camps and also um, like holiday camps and stuff like March break? But it, it just to clarify, pro D day camps and day camps are under 
a completely separate Nix code that is also like can be considered recreational. Thank you. Any other questions before? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll. Okay. Council. After hearing from staff and from the proponent, do we have additional questions for uh, for our staff? Councilor Penningill? Yeah, I heard a mention of uh, NICS codes, and I'm just wondering if staff can clarify what NICS codes are. I, I can, um, through you, Mayor. Uh, so those are codes, I think, that federally classify different businesses. Um, they're not always consistent with zoning, obviously. You know, every jurisdiction there's probably no two jurisdictions that have the same definitions. So it's not uh, it's not always a direct correlation to zoning definitions for business uses. Thank you. Any other questions for, oh, Councillor Stoner. Thank you. Through the chair, I'm wondering if staff can remind me, last term when we did the zoning bylaw update in the business park, we put a lot of work into trying to protect the employment lands and, and the industrial use of those lands, but we still allow fitness centers as one of the allowable uses. And so I'm wondering if somebody can remind me why we did that. Is that because there was an existing fitness center facility in the area or because a lot of the issues that we're talking about stem from, I think this misalignment between fitness center and recreation, but I'm wondering why we allowed fitness center when I think that's maybe one of the challenges in this, in this zone. Uh, through the mayor, my recollection is that fitness center was all, allowed to maintain in I-8 as it was an existing permitted use. And there was a number of fitness centers uh, in this zone. Uh, in the rest of I-11, fitness center was spot zoned to uh, business uh, locations where there were existing businesses at the time we were doing the bylaw amendment. I believe that was the rationale for that. Councillor Stoner, you look like you might have a follow up, but are you okay for for now? Yeah, I'm just kicking ourselves for a previous decision. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, go ahead, Councillor French. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm I'm noting the dance studio uh, discussion that that has been mentioned, um, and I'm I'm looking to staff for some thoughts on uh, the difference between a, a a dance studio and what we're talking about with this um, business. In so to set it up, is it correct that um, we've the, the district has already approved a dance studio for the same building. Is that correct? Uh, not to my knowledge, but that is not something that I looked into in advance of this. Yes. <clears throat> my understanding is that dance studios, they sort of dance in the, the gray area of being between a fitness center and indoor recreation. And historically, we've had a number of dance studios in the business park, um, or at least one uh, that I can think of. So I think that I can I can I can't confirm the question whether there is another one there, but um, but I know that it's a bit of a gray area. If I could add, I know for uh, I can confirm that not at this location, but dance studios have been permitted under fitness center in the business park on other on other properties in the past. Yeah, there there are two that I know of in I-11, which is very similar to the I-8 zone. And uh, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out in my own head how we justify allowing dance studios for sure in I-11 and possibly in I-8 in this same building, but we don't allow this activity, which is also recreational. Don't think there's a question in there, but um, I'm thinking out loud as we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will try to hold it to questions, but I appreciate they don't always come to us as, we, uh, as we're working through it. Um, 
I'm, I've, I'll take a stab at a question here and then, um, you know, with the work we've done around zoning bylaws in, in general and the various reviews that we've, that we've done, um, one of the main, uh, drivers was, um, you know, flexibility to make, to make sure that the, um, that, uh, things that don't neatly fit can find, can find a home. And I was curious if staff could comment on how they, uh, in the general, in the general sense, um, continue that principle in as they're making the types of decisions that we're here to to discuss tonight. Like, how, where does that fit? Given that we have something that isn't fitting, and we have a zoning bylaw that we've set out to make flexible and make it and make it work. So, how how do you balance those? Uh, through you, Mayor, I think there's obviously competing objectives at times, um, especially in the business park where uh, we are trying to preserve uh, industrial employment space given the lack of it around town. Um, so there are obviously on other zoning bylaw update projects we've worked on, the goal has been to increase flexibility. That's not always appropriate in every part of town, uh, again, when there are competing objectives. Okay, thank you. Councilor, oh, Councilor Stoner. Yeah, I'm just wondering if staff can speak again to what percentage of the floor area would need to be light use or uh, light industrial for it to be for the for it to be considered a light industrial business. Uh, through the mayor, I guess. Uh, so that's a bit of a, a tricky question because typically an accessory use would be a use that is ancillary to the principal use and would be less than 50% of the floor area. Um, I, I'm not sure that staff felt that providing uh, sensory play and, and art classes were accessory to manufacturing of art facilities. Um, that's, that's again a bit of this gray area. Typically, you know, if you're producing something, if you're manufacturing something on site and you have accessory retail, that is ancillary to uh, that, you know, for example, uh, the bakery uh, adjacent, they have a small storefront where they sell some of the baked goods that they produce on site, that's accessory retail. Uh, so again, there is a bit of a gray area as to if you're producing an art, um, you know, art kits, if providing Excess, you know, art classes and sensory play is actually accessory to that manufacturing or not. Councillor Stone, do you have a follow up? Nope. Um, I'm curious about, and I, I see your hand there. I think we might be on the same wavelength, but the, uh, I'm curious around, um, you know, as, as business go, goes on and things and things change. And in this case, it sounds like we've, we have, um, a business that is uh, started out uh, in one direction and is and is transitioning over time, and I, I'm just trying to understand that that uh, how that you know what a clear threshold would would be because um, I know we've delegated the, this uh, the authority to make these types of decisions, so we don't thus we don't see them very often. So I would appreciate how how is that ac accounted for or uh, how what documentation would you ask to feel comfortable that that threshold has been crossed? Uh, great question. But I think where we've landed, um, and you know, this has taken uh, a while to get here. There's lots of discussion with the applicants, of course, but the sensory play, uh, the art classes, we, they're not accessory. Um, we're considering them as a so, sort of a principal use that falls better under the, the assembly use. So we just can't justify it um, as an accessory use to, to manufacturing. So, thank you. Okay. Um, one of the other pieces that I, I heard was that um, staff brought up the lack of a, a partition in as one of the uh, one of the challenges in establishing what exact percentage split is of the physical space, um, and um, if that was provide, I'm assuming there was a discussion about providing that or not provide providing that. But if if that was provided, does that change uh, 
much the interpretation of where of where we of where we are it just feels like that was uh, a discussion that must have happened and we're not quite hearing all of it sorry through the chair yes that goes back to my comments um the application is fixed the the decision was rendered on the information that's in front of you we can't amend the application then we're not reconsidering the decision we're making an entirely new decision so we're not able to do that unfortunately i suppose the question is was that was that discussed before we arrived at the at the decision if that's a sticking point at this at this point it, and it felt like it was in the presentation so that's what i was looking to understand is if that was discussed in that uh before time where we locked in uh the the both the proposal and the um the regulations that are, that apply so i'm just curious where we sit in 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 that um um the fact that there wasn't a partition made it really i think that's what sort of led us to believe that these are going to be two principal uses um operating in the same space i don't think we discussed with the applicants you know what should they partition off and we try not to do that we not try not to guide the applicants to you know um fit in the definition they have to come up with a proposal that fits um so I, I don't believe we've had discussions on that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Council, we're, uh, I think everyone's spoken a couple of times. Councillor Stoner, I'll give you the last last chance. We need to move towards a, a decision here somehow. Go ahead, Councillor yeah. Stoner. Thank you. And my question is a little bit around process here. So I think, and Mr. Baxton mentioned this off the top, where I think for me in particular, and having a hard time in this definition of indoor recreation versus assembly. And so I'm curious if staff can speak to if, if it seems like we have a differing interpretation of indoor recreation amongst staff and perhaps some of council, um, what is the process then? Like, do we need to amend our definition of indoor recreation in the zoning bylaw so it's more clear? Um, how do we address how do we address this perhaps gap in the definition or the interpretation of the definition of indoor recreation if it should include non-physical recreation? Um, through the chair, if you want to change the definition, yes, you have to amend the zoning bylaw, which is the three readings and a public hearing. If you formally want to change that that definition and the, and the policy and the direction to to staff, okay. Thank you for that clarity, um, Councillor Penningill. So we've had a fair number of questions about whether or not this fits the definitions, uh, and, and just going back to. My question about the purpose of a TUP, I'm wondering how much it matters um, that it fits the existing definition when we're talking about a temporary use permit, which allows uses other than what the zoning bylaw um, permits. And so I, I guess, is there a sort of informal weighting of the closer you are to the permitted uses, the less sort of uh, OCP other OCP alignment you need to make it acceptable. And if you're way off the the uh, normally accepted uses in the zone, then you rely on much greater support or alignment with OCP policy. Like I'm just sort of trying to understand a little bit about how we interpret this makes sense as a temporary use permit, which doesn't fit the zoning by law, but we do think this is okay, at least on a temporary basis. Uh, through the mayor, uh, staff would review the TUP application against the relevant policies, and that would inform their decision and the recommendation that is made to the director and ultimately their decision. Um, that being said, this process exists so that council has the applicant has the opportunity to appeal the decision of the director, and council can ultimately make the decision that they choose to on this temporary use permit application. Uh, staff reviewed the relevant policies. Um, 
in the OCP and and made the decision to not recommend approval of this, but council has the decision to make whatever decision they would like. Thank you. Council, I'm looking for, uh, we need to, uh, I think we've, we've been around the circle uh, more than more than twice, which is where I try to hold us. And uh, we're moving on to need to drive towards a, de a decision. Is there anyone I would entertain a motion at this time if someone was ready to make one or? Councillor French. Chair, um, I'll move that council endorse the appeal and approve temporary use permit uh, number DTU 00033 as requested by the applicant. And if I have a seconder, I'll speak to it. Councillor Greenlaw seconds. And I'll let you speak to it, Councillor French. Thanks. Um, I, I don't come to this lightly. I have a great deal of faith in our staff. Uh, I think that uh, the District of Squamish staff is extraordinary and does excellent work and uh, pays very close attention to detail. And, and what we have here is uh, very close attention to detail. Wording is very important. Definitions are very important. And uh, we've, we've found ourselves in a situation where our, our business park has become quite gray. And the the one hurdle that I'm having the most difficulty getting over is the dance studios that we have allowed to exist in our I-11 zone, which is very similar to the I-8 zone. And um, I can't justify in my own mind allowing the dance studios con to continue to do what they do, which has very similar parking challenges uh, as uh, the applicant um, is bumping up against. Uh, it's it's all cultural, it's all recreational. Um, and I'm, I'm taking this step because it allows us three years to figure out solutions, whether that's amending the zoning bylaw or uh, having this particular business shift uh, their focus so that they fit better in the industrial um, uh, the industrial realm. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Penningill. Uh, clarifying question. I'm not sure if this is for the mover or maybe to Ms. Arthur's whether or not the duration of the temporary use permit, which it sounds like the intention is three years, if that is explicit enough in what has been moved or if that needs to be more explicit. You can add the three years to the motion. Up to three years. Was that what you were asking? Yeah, can, um, or was the motion that didn't include the timeline, does that just imply three years or do we need to ex... Sorry, Mike. There's a legislated cap of three years and then a further three years uh, or two year extension, three year or two years. We've moved them it around. So that's why I'm question mark. Okay. But yeah. So then the motion should contain the intended duration. It's not just implied by issuing a TUP in this case. I would put it in the motion, but it is they're, they're capped out. They can't go four years, for example. An extension is considered by council, has to be considered by council. Right, okay. So, um, Councillor Penningill, would you like to maybe make a, a suggest an amendment uh, to the, the, t, the motion? Uh, yeah, for clarity, I would, uh, if it's a friendly amendment, um, endorse the appeal and approve temporary use permit for three years as requested by the applicant. I'm happy with that. Okay. Um, so it has a three, has a three year and then the, and on a similar point, I hope we don't have to do this twice. The, um, the potential for renewal is over the horizon. We don't need to worry about that in this particular uh, piece because a renewal is, uh, would option would be available at the end of that three years should it be should it be needed is that correct i just want to make sure we all understand that's that's correct okay thank you um 
Okay, so any anyone else like to speak to to the motion? Go ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thank you. Um, this is in in some ways echoing what Councillor uh, French had to say. I think this is a case where words are important. Um, and in our definition of indoor recreation, meaning the use of a building for indoor recreation activities that require warehouse type space, uh, I do think uh, I can absolutely see art activities requiring warehouse type space, even if it's even if it weren't a high ceiling, I can absolutely see that being a necessity for an art type space. And while I think that the friction here is coming from maybe the original intent of those words to mean something physical, that's not what they say. And so uh, on, on balance, uh, I'll speak to uh, in support uh, of the appeal uh, because the words that we've used for the definition of indoor recreation do not exclude art. Thank you. Councillor Anderson. Thank you. I will be reluctantly speaking against the present motion on the floor. Um, there is reference to uh, time for our district to consider a fit in zoning. Three years is referenced now in the, mo in the motion before us. It seems to me that we should be devoting that time and energy to other areas, other solutions. We have an arts, cultural and heritage strategy, section six, all about cultural spaces. And in fact, I think the activity of this enterprise fits in there. We need to devote attention to the action items in that strategy. So we need to plug into where the Arts Squamish and Studio Hub Architects project is looking at cultural spaces and we need to really get serious about planning for facilities for these cultural type of activities. And the, we also, as the staff have pointed out, the mud zone and the C11 zones, uh, these we may, may be evolving and we need to consider these types of uses in relation to those zones as well. Um, the applicant or the staff have mentioned it is challenging to manage unpartitioned assembly use. They've also referred to parking bylaw implications. The proponent, the applicant has referred to, quote, not setting precedents. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm, I'm uncertain on whether that's the case. I am clear that the rules are inequitable, but I'm not sure that the emphasis should be where the motion is directed. Um, we, the reference to dance studios, there are two dance studios right now, in fact, at least two dance program activities, two of them, I think, in I-11. And this is a concern for me. And in fact, the representatives of the dance community are uh, presently engaged in finding long-term solutions that doesn't involve industrial warehouse space. Even though a lot of our cultural activities set design for the theater does use warehouse type space, but the solution isn't the business park. We've gone through a zoning bylaw, uh, a couple of years ago, a lot of work. It's not perfect. The definitions aren't perfect, but the paramount objective was preserving light industrial uses. So we have also constraints in, our, in the challenges of the business licensing and our applications process. These are facts of life. They're not going to be perfect. We're falling through the cracks here, but I think the emphasis should be elsewhere on elsewhere in strategies, elsewhere in land use, and elsewhere in zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Um, Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, I, I am going to support this and I, I, I propose the the first uh, alteration of the three years just for clarity's sake, but um, thinking about this, I, I will support this TUP um, for a couple of reasons. I, when I think about the discussions we've had over our last term as a council, um, I don't think our staff's interpretation of the bylaws has been unreasonable um and and so uh i do think though uh when i consider my own intent with what i was trying to get at when we approve these zonings um it is consistent with this sort of business and and so i think or at the time it was anyways and and so for that reason um i'm comfortable with it temporary use permit which is temporary it is um if, if it is supported it's a guarantee for three years but it is not a guarantee 
thereafter in this space. I think we do have some more work to do. We've had a, a recent report from Economic Development in October, which I think does shed um, a somewhat of a different light than we've had before on on our space and how we need to use it but i do think um a three month window um to sort some or sorry a three year window to sort some of those issues out um makes sense in the context of the many conversations we've been having and and i i also take this as a um uh i guess a bit of a, a learning as a, as a counselor in terms of how we have to be very cautious about, and as one of my colleagues mentioned, what we say and how we articulate what we intend. And, you know, when we're approving a zoning bylaw, being very, very sure that our intent are coming across uh, crystal clear because we have all sorts of conversations and, and, and the more staff has to interpret that, the more challenging it is for everyone. But in this um, instance, I think a temporary use permit makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stoner. Thank you. Through the chair, um, this is a tricky one for me, and I see both sides of it. I think Councillor Pettingill just articulated a lot of what I was going to say. Um, if I think back to the work that we did on the zoning bylaw updates to try and preserve and protect light industrial space last term, um, that was really important work, and we were seeing a lot of conflicts in the business park, uh, particularly with, with businesses that needed light industrial space and, and fitness centers and breweries and restaurants moving in, and that created some clashes, and it was driving up prices. And um, But when we did do that work, I think to me, if I think back to that work, the I-8 and the I-9 were areas that we kind of had seen had gone too far almost from a light industrial perspective. Um, there were already fitness centers in there. Uh, it was becoming a bit of a service core area. And I think one of the pieces that I reflect on today is we allowed fitness centers because they were existing uses, but we never contemplated a use like this. I think this particular use that's come forward is really gray. It doesn't fit particularly in indoor recreation it doesn't fit in assembly from my perspective. It doesn't really fit as a fitness center. And so I don't really know where it fits, um, but I think that for now, a three-year TUP is an appropriate use here, given the other issues that we, or the other businesses that are operating in this area. I don't think it's out of line from what's being provided in the Aikido uh, uh, business or the Mountain Fitness Center business. I think there's a lot of compatible uses actually in this area. And so I'm willing to enable uh, enable this business to move in for three years. Um, and uh, I will consider putting a follow on motion, a follow up motion on the floor around um, perhaps tightening up our definition of indoor recreation so that it becomes a little bit clearer over time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also hesitant to do that because we often try and leave definitions broad so that they can be broadly interpreted um, but that also creates gray area so um, that's the other piece that i'm wrestling with is how do we manage that when i personally read the definition of indoor recreation i had assumed it would have allowed for non-physical act uh, recreational activities and so um, i will mull on that and maybe bring it forward after a uh, call on this vote but thank you uh, everybody for the discussion Thank you, Councillor Stoner. Um, I'm gonna be speaking in favor of the motion. Um, and I agree that staff's uh, inter interpretation um, is a reasonable interpretation of what's, of what's there. But what is a tipping point for me and makes me feel that this is an appropriate course is that this is a business in, in a transitional time that doesn't fit currently in the pieces. And I think it's a, I think it's a very appropriate use of a temporary, uh, of a, of a temporary uh, use permit to bridge to bridge that gap, and as those um, those thresholds are crossed, as we uh, discussed during the, the question time, uh, period, I'm I'm hoping at the end of this um, uh, period that it'll be more clearly defined as to what uh, what that looks like, and we have a business that's looking to um, to advance their their causes and change their business model, and 
I think it's innovative and, and I'm happy to be able to take uh, a small step to, um, to grant some room to, for them to do that. And, uh, and over time fit into a, a neater box and I hope they're successful in their new, um, the, the sort of emerging portion of their business that does clearly fit into that, uh, commercial and, uh, warehouse, um, aspect. Um, I would feel a little more comfortable if we had some work done around the partitioning, but I'm not going to, um, further muddy the waters in this process by, uh, stipulating a, a percentage or a partition. But I would say that it, to the proponent, it would go a long way at the end of this process. If something was clearly defined there that to show the, the percentage, uh, split. So, um, but I won't go so far as to suggest an amendment to the motion or be more prescriptive as to what that is. So with that, uh, I'll call the question all in favor. Motion carries. Oh, sorry. Uh, and oppose. Councilor Anderson opposes. Uh, motion carries. Thank you so much. Councilor Stoner. I'm going to test a motion that we refer the indoor recreation definition to a future zoning bylaw update review. Good second. Mr. Fentry, are you seconding that? Okay. Um, would you like to, to speak to it? And then I see uh, Councilor Pettingill has his hand up as well, but. Yeah, my intention is to add this to the list of things that staff Often when the zoning bylaw update comes for review, uh, just for a discussion, I don't actually know what the right answer is here, but it has definitely flagged uh, the need for a conversation around how we define recreation um, and whether that needs a little bit more uh, guardrails in our current definition or not. So I would like to have that, diff that discussion amongst council when the opportunity arises with the next zoning bylaw update. Okay, thank you. Um... Councillor Penningill, did you want to speak to this? Uh, I guess just to clarify for, from the mover, um, is the intent that we have a meeting focused on this topic or just that the next time we are looking at the zoning bylaw, we, we flag this as one of the items we are going to touch on? Just that it's flagged in the list of things that would be reviewed in the next zoning bylaw update. Can we read the motion back just to make sure that we have the the clarity on on that? So we're moving towards clarity instead of further muddying the waters, which I'm not sure where we sit quite yet. Do you do you have it? That council refer the indoor recreation definition to a future zoning bylaw update review. Okay, I think that that covers it. Um, anyone else comments on this? With that, I'll. Go ahead. Yeah, I will support this. I think there's some other just coming out of this whole experience, uh, some other terms or or thoughts we may want to look at. Um, but it sounds like this doesn't preclude uh, sort of looking at those things. And this will be a good good reminder that we need to pay attention to some of these things. So I think it's supportable. Thank you. Thank you. And to be clear, this this motion doesn't presuppose what the outcome of that process is. It's just that there's a, a that there's a discussion around it and. Uh, and we all understand where, where we are and, and do a check-in. So, um, and for that reason, I'll, I'll be supporting. So with that, I'll call the question. Um, all in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much to staff and to the, to the proponents. Um, and thank you, um, Councillor Stoner for, for bringing that up. Um, so I'd like to, um, suspend the order here and move on to we've got some folks and we heard from some folks earlier uh from the main so i'm gonna i'd like to pull forward um the staff report from financial services item 10a1 uh to go next and then we'll move on with our with our agenda just to get uh these folks here and i saw Oh, <laughs> okay, well, well, let's do, we'll do consent agenda, which is generally quick and I'll buy us a little bit of time and then we'll, we'll hear from it. We'll hear from that. So, um, so with that, um, consent agenda, um, 
this is your opportunity to pull anything uh, from that. Uh, I saw Kelser French first and then Hamilton. I'd like to pull the special business meeting minutes of November 15th. No, sorry. A regular. Can you go to Council Hamilton while I sort myself out? <laughs> yeah, I. I think I know where you're going, but I'm not sure which one it is either. So I'll let you figure that out and get back to us. Councillor Hamilton, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to pull the, um, the correspondence from the from Tourism Squamish. Okay, so that's item B1. Uh, one. B1. Okay. And I sorted myself out. All right, where, where did we land? <laughs> Special business meeting, November 15th. Okay. Could I have a mover for the consent uh, agenda without those two items? Moved by Councillor Anderson, second by Councillor Pettingill. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for that. Um, so we will, sorry, I tried to move that item ahead, but we just got to make sure the right staff person's here. So I'll, um, So next we're going on to consideration of council committee uh, recommendations, and then we'll go there. Um, so item eight, one is recommendation from committee of the whole November, from November 29th uh, that, and the motion is that prior to terms of reference development for an estuary environment coordination plan that council addresses the status of district policy regarding estuary management committee. Um, Councilor Anderson, did you have uh, something on this topic? Yes, Mayor Herford. I'm not clear of the exact procedure we'll follow here, but I wish to propose an amendment to my motion uh, that was seconded by Councilor French uh, during the last meeting. Uh, Hold on, it... one, one second. Well, let's get some clarity on procedure. I, yep. I, so, um, Ms. Arthurs, yep. do we need to vote? No. Nope. Would... So the motion that, this is a recommendation from the Committee of the Whole and it's sort of there tabled. However, Councillor Anderson can essentially put a different motion, move a different motion, his his amended motion or you know, updated motion. Okay, and then that recommendation from committee, Just we don't have to do anything. You don't have to. It, do it dies by itself. We don't have to vote it down or something like that. It just, okay. So Councillor Anderson, do you have a, um, go ahead with your, your new motion that? Yes, I do, uh, Mayor, Mayor Herford, and it will read as follows. That council discuss the scope and purposes of the proposed estuary environmental coordination plan project in relation to the Squamish Estuary Management Plan and the Estuary Management Committee, SEMSI, at a future committee of the whole meeting. If there's a seconder, I'll speak to it. Before I second, I'm just, um, do you feel that this motion provides uh, this new motion provides a uh, entirely different direction or uh, from this or is this or is your motion meant just to be to provide more clarity i just want to understand where thank you for the question mayor herford uh, and it is a a, a, a key one uh, my my purpose is to add clarity rather than to change the import of the earlier motion which was to delay the initiative of uh, engaging a consultant to devise terms of reference. I, my, my, my purpose is, is not changed there. I do recommend this and my, my motion, however, has introduced another element, hopefully to add clarity, which I may explain. Thank you for that. Is there a seconder for the, for the motion? Second by Councillor Hamilton. Um, do you have further comments on, on this? Thank you. Uh, the element of clarity I hope to add uh, here is uh, not least to add the Squamish Estuary Management Plan to the phrasing of the motion. The Estuary Management Plan has three components. It is a land use plan, it is a project review uh, committee which has not been functional since 2013, and it is the management committee which uh, has a different function again. There's also habitat compensation agreements as part of the Estuary Management Plan and the Wildlife Management Area Management Plan is an appendix to SEMP. SEMC is fundamental to the estuary management plan uh, because certain sectors gave up and or sought security 
both waterfront industry and conservation. And so they were given a seat at the table at SEMSI, an important consideration for them and remains so. Uh, this uh, SEMSI and the SEMP are together uh, referenced in the OCP, approximately 18 references in the OCP, and the Marine Action Strategy. Some of the wording regarding SEMSI uh, includes coordinate with, collaborate with, recognize, utilize SEMSI. There is unfortunately no accounting for or any communication from staff regarding a change in this district policy. And so this, this begs the question in the, in the present project description. This estuary coordination plan uh, project description has new information and is new in that it has no reference to the estuary management committee or the estuary management plan. Governance issues have arisen over the last few years, four years since this SERP project has arisen and also since we've been implementing the Marine Action Strategy. Persistent questions have arisen uh, regarding SEMSI appointments, management of appointments, convening, activation, reactivation, just very recently. Over the last four years, each and every local sector or organization has been involved in raising these questions persistently. Uh, just to wrap up, some uh, the staff in certain correspondence has referred to a new initiative to uh, under the auspices of the Marine Action Strategy to address governance in a new form of committee, the, the substance of the uh, project plan in the budget. However, it's not clear what is meant by the same functions as SMC. It, is, it has never been all that clear. Uh, rel uh, it, well, there has been persistent confusions as to the functions of SMC. It's not project review, never has been. So th there are these uncertainties. I suggest finally that there is already an existing platform, SMC for waterfront and estuary governance. It has an appropriate mandate. Geographic scope is flexible. Its structure is flexible in that it is, it is allowed to uh, strike subcommittees and task committees, and it can be adjusted as has been discussed to address the senior government uh, participation into a two-tier structure. I'll leave it at that, Mayor Herford. So my suggestion is that it is important that we address the implications of our uh, ongoing and, and not, uh, there, there are certainly persistent policies regarding SEMSI, the throughout our policy uh, OCP and, and Marine Action Strategy. This is important to discuss before we strike forward with new terms of reference. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Anderson. Anyone else speak to it? Uh, Councillor French. Thanks, Mayor. And um, speaking in support of the motion, um, consistent with um, last week, I, I still believe there are longstanding issues with the Squamish Estuary Management um, and, and jurisdictional clarity is, is needed. I believe that this is a long overdue council conversation and I uh, look forward to, uh, to having it when we get around to it. Thank you. Councillor Penningill. Yeah, and uh, I hope it's not too late to ask a a question of clarifying question of staff if it's a clarifying question to staff then that's that's allowed but uh take a swing at it and we'll see we'll see where that where that goes okay so and and there's a mention made of i think i heard this item in the budget as i understand this was not a budget item this was in our um basically our update letting us know the progress of work and this was upcoming work, which had been approved and previously budgeted, previously discussed by council. So this isn't a sort of future looking budget decision. This is us changing um, existing work already approved and, and, and discussed, I believe. And so I, I just, I'm looking um, to understand one, am I correct in that understanding? Uh, maybe I'll start, that's the first question. So this item was in the budget. I believe it appeared for the first time in 2021 and was a carryover into this year's fiscal. So it was, it was, uh, a, had approved budget and, um, was my understanding. I don't know if anyone from staff would like to, uh, clarify further. Uh, through the chair. Yes. That that's my understanding as well. Thank you. A, yeah, just to put a further point, this didn't come to us then as a carry forward in the budget. We saw this 
we had a lot of discussions, but the context of this was in that quarterly update of sort of where we are in current work as opposed to a budget discussion. Is that correct? Correct. At that, when it came, came to us was, uh, or when this discussion started was in our Q3, um, up, update, uh, project update, which our role there was to understand what was in progress and where these projects were not necessarily to read debate. The okay. Subjects, which. Okay. Thank you. And the, the other, um, I don't recall this question being asked, but, um, some of the concerns or questions being raised by my colleague is, is that the intent of the project that we saw in the financial update to sort of address some of these, uh, address these things, or is, is, uh, what my colleague has suggested, um, different or in addition to what this, this thing in our quarterly update was already supposed to be doing. Through the chair, I, I think the additional content that Councillor Anderson is suggesting brings substantial background and context to the to the issue of whether or not we're going to have or how we're going to have or when we're going to have some form of committee or governance structure that may pick up where SMC left off. So it, it's just additional context. We're, we're able to have that decision sometime in that discussion with council sometime in the near year. We, we had planned it. So if we want to bring this issue back to um, Committee of the Whole in Q1 of next year, that's entirely doable. Thank you. Any, anyone else to speak to this? I, um, when the first motion was, was made, I, um, I, I opposed it, um, due to delaying the, uh, the onset of the work. Um, but I, I think in this case, in pra very practical senses, um, you know, upon reflection, I think that, um, we can get this committee of the whole in, in Q1 and given that we're in early December, that's going to come uh, to us fairly, fairly quickly. So I think in the practical senses, we're not delaying, um, an immense amount of time, uh, and there is urgency, but there is urgency around, in my mind, around estuary management. And if we have to take this step of getting to committee of the whole to, uh, collectively understand, um, what that is and what that means to the, to this council, then I think that's a worthwhile step. So I'll be supporting, um, this direction, um, at this time. Uh, sorry, Councillor Stoner, did I just see your, I wasn't sure if that was a cough or if you're, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. We are going to, um, so I've suspended, I'll suspend the order uh, and we'll pull ahead the. Um, Chair? Oh, yes, go ahead. There was one more motion from Committee of the Whole. Do you want to? Oh, sorry, I got. Uh... I'll move it. I'll second it. Oh yes, of course. The uh, and that motion is a two-parter, so we're going to say all of that is together from Committee of the Whole. That's the um, the redirect of the BC COVID nineteen restart grant. Um, any further discussion needed on that one? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for that for that catch. Um, and now we're going to pull ahead the um, the report from financial services uh, regarding uh, three seven eight eight one Cleveland Avenue Strata unit property owners utility billings. And um, a little bit earlier, we heard uh, from some unscheduled public attendance. And I think the best order of operations here, uh, similar to the first topic that we had is we'll have staff present and then we'll invite our, um, the, our, uh, unscheduled public attendants to, to speak. Oh, it has to be the other way around. Okay. So Miss Collins, I believe was the name. If you, sorry, you get to go first and, uh, Miss Arthur's is it five, sorry, I just have to check with the procedure by five minutes. You've got five minutes to address uh, 
address council and then we'll hear from we'll hear from staff that way so over to you and again if you could start with your name and your address as you did before. sure thank you um so thank you very much again for letting me speak today um myself and other members other residents of the main um uh, concerned about this issue and we're very glad to be able to speak to you all. Um, so my name is Alice Collins and I live at 517-37881 Cleveland Avenue, which is the main building. Um, and I'm here to represent the affected residents or owners of the main building. So thank you for giving us a chance to speak. Um, this issue has caused some emotional and potential financial stress for the residents. And so um, again, we're very happy to be here. We've read the report to council and we agree wholeheartedly that the district has a responsibility to administer tax in a fair and equitable manner to all residents of the district of Squamish. However, we have several concerns with the incomplete nature of the analysis in the report and we do not find staff's recommendation to be fair or equitable at this time. We expect that the district will treat all residents as valuable members of Squamish but we do not expect to be held responsible for utilities that are outstanding from previous owners or the developer of the building. A key area of concern in the report to count that the report to council does not address is that several residents credited the developer for utilities during uh, the time period in question when purchasing their property from the developer. These residents understood that in crediting the developer their portion of the utilities owing, the responsibility was on the developer to pay the district for these utilities. These, these residents have been billed again by the district, effectively billing them twice. We note in March 2022, the developer paid utilities for only some of the units, 32 units out of approximately 96. This payment totaled 23 uh, $0.2,000. They were originally billed $69,000. It is unclear to the residents of the main, despite trying to be in contact with staff from the district, why that this wasn't followed up. What correspondence has been had with the developer about the outstanding sum? Um, it is unclear to us what steps the district has taken to attempt to resolve this issue with the developer between March 2022 when they paid a portion of the bill and September 2022 when that bill was then forwarded to residents. There are 18 owners being billed who did not own the property during the relevant time period. The district did not notify the initial owners who purchased in 2020 that utilities were owing into 2021 or 2022. As a result of this oversight, the second or subsequent owners in 2021 and 2022 were not made aware that there were outstanding utilities on the tax certificate that was provided to us by the district via our notaries and lawyers um, when we purchased our units. We feel that the staff's recommendation could set a bit of a dangerous precedent that tax certificates from the municipality cannot be trusted and may not be accurate. We also take issue with the lack of accurate and timely communication we've received from the district on this issue so far. Months after the developer paid only a portion of the bill that was issued to them, the district sent each of us a letter labelled a reminder notice. This is the first notice any of us have ever received that we owe money on our properties. Uh, the notice also contained information that we've been unable to validate with the district. As I said, we've been trying to contact staff and have received no communication. And the letter also had threats to financial penalties. Again, this causes emotional distress for people. Um, as I've said before, we've tried to contact the district and received no by email, phone, in person. We've showed up here and received no communication. In many cases, no one from the district has responded to us at all. Um, in summary, we would like to appeal to the council that we think everyone can understand if you were to receive a bill for $763, for services you never received or that you previously paid, you would expect some communication about that issue. So far, we've received no answers. We request the support of the council in resolving this issue. We ask that council request staff issue a communication to residents that removes the threat of penalties if we don't pay this bill. 
We also ask Council to request that staff conduct a more thorough and fulsome analysis of the range of situations currently facing property owners, including where some owners credited money to the developer that's and are your, now- That's your five minutes, but I'll give you just a little bit to pull done. it together. Okay, almost go ahead. Done. And are now being charged for a second time. We believe it would be reasonable for, this, for staff to seek payment from the owners of the property during, of, from payment, payment from owners of the property during the relevant time period that benefited, benefited from said utility usage. We ask that further analysis also be given uh, on, the, uh, on the option of writing off these bills where possible. The residents of the main believe that the council's considerations of our concerns and requests would be the fair and equitable thing to do at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I think we'd like to, thank you. Do, are there any clarifying questions here? I think we should go to staff and, okay. Thank you very much for your, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Keep, keep in mind that we're gonna hear from, from yeah. staff here shortly. Just to Is it possible to um, call them back if we have a question that staff is not able to answer, but they might be able to? If uh, I'll, if appropriate, we that Great. might be a possibility, but um, thank you not exactly sure what the threshold for that is so thanks let's see where we go here thank you thank you very much for your your submission and and spending a portion of your evening here with us and i'll turn it over to staff now uh to make the presentation and hello mayor and council my name is Rianne susa and i'm the director of financial operations at the district and i'm joined here today by the district's general manager of financial services heather boxrood the goal of the presentation today is to present on the may to december 2020 utility billings for 96 residential strata unit owners at 37881 cleveland avenue so that council can make a decision on the collection of these utility billings First, I'll review the key legislation. The key legislation pertaining to these utility buildings is in section 247 of the community charter. This section legislatively requires the district to apportion utility balances owing from the developer roll number to the subdivided properties roll numbers. Further to this, the district's legal obligation remains the same even when the property has been sold. Now moving into the background, in May 2020, the district sent the annual property tax and utility notices to the developer of 37881 Cleveland Avenue. In 2020, the developer paid the annual property taxes and did not pay the utility balance owing. Further to this, the district followed its collection process and sent utility notices advising the developer that the 2020 balance was outstanding in 2020, 2021, and 2022. In March 22, 2022, the developer's representative made a payment of 23.2,000, which was the collection of 32 strata unit owners' amounts owing. As legislatively required by Section 247 of the Community Charter, the district apportioned utility balances to the 64 remaining strata units. Sorry, just before you do this slide, can we get the date correct? I think, did I hear that right? It says May 2020. The developers oh, representative sorry. made a payment and I think I heard something different. Just can you align those? It two? is May 2022. May 2022 May is what that's. May 2022 is okay. when the developer made the payment. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Since sending the note utility notices to 64 residents at 37881 Cleveland Avenue in September 22, 2022, the district has received several inquiries from strata unit owners or the representative that do not agree with the utility billings. The common threads of disagreement are the delay in receiving the utility notice. Strata unit owners have received their 2021 and 2022 utility notices and neither showed a balance owing from 2020. 18 of the strata unit owners did not own the unit in 2020. Tax certificates were issued without the 2020 balance owing on it, and the district billed the developer, and therefore this should be the developer's liability to pay. Oh, 
over the past two months since sending the utility notices and hearing the residents um, residents inquiries, we have taken our time to do due diligence and be able to bring this forward to Council. We were working with the ministry and that does take time. The first option are there are two legislative options available to the, to the district and they are first the option or number one is we can or the district can continue to collect the utility balances owing from the individual strata unit owners. It should be noted that this is the legislative requirement and therefore on a policy basis staff are obligated to make this recommendation. The second option is to request a minister's order from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs to write off the utility fees built to the 96 strata unit owners. The ministry has confirmed that the district does not have the option to write off only select utility fee accounts for the affected owners. For example, the district cannot write off the utility fees for the 18 strata unit owners that did not own their strata unit in 2020. It has to write off all 96 accounts, whether paid or unpaid. When weighing these options, the key factors to consider are equal treatment and tax collection across the district's property owners and impacted property owners' fairness concerns around collecting utility fees that are invoiced one and a half years late. 78 of the current property owners were the owners of the property in 2020 and therefore were the benefactors of the utility usage. Writing off this balance is not equitable treatment of property owners in the greater community who were required to pay utility usage during that time. Similarly, proceeding with collection could be considered an inequity for the 18 strata unit owners that did not own their unit in 2020. As noted on the previous slide, option one is the legislative requirement and therefore on a policy basis, district staff are obligated to put forward the motion, the following motion for council consideration. The motion for consideration is that the district of Squamish proceed with the legislative requirement to collect the utility billings from the 96 strata unit owners at 37881 Cleveland Avenue. We are now at the end of the presentation, so I will now turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Council, I see Councillor Greenlaw. Um, I'm curious um, as to what uh, Ms. Collins mentioned about the residents already paying the utility bills to the developer. I didn't see that in anything presented from Council. Is that something you were aware of? Is, is there any evidence of that? Is there any action in that manner? Working with the developer's representative, we were, the developer collected, just wanna make sure that I get the number correct, 32 accounts um, from units. So 32 units accounts, which total 23.2 thousand, which is where that number is coming from. If there are additional um, additional uh, units that the, that the residents are speaking to that hasn't been brought to our attention until now. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton and Councillor French. Um, are some of the residents being asked to, to pay for the 2020 utilities after having already paid for the 2020 utilities? The Alice had mentioned that some people were being double billed and that I had not heard. So is that happening? To the best of our knowledge, no, that is new information that we just heard tonight as well. Councillor French, uh, Pettingill. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and I'm uh, curious to know if the developer provided any reason for not fully paying the 2022 utility tax the 2020 utility tax in, in any of the discussions with the developer or representative? Through the chair, we have spoken with the developer's representative and have been advised that the reason that the developer did not pay the utility fees was it's in the purchase agreement that the purchaser is responsible for the um, payment of utility fees. However, that is just through confirmation of the 
the developer's representative. Okay, and uh, it's my understanding that often uh, development companies that create projects like this, once the project has wrapped up, the development company folds. Um, does the developer, the development company responsible for the construction of this building still exist, or is it now an entity that has been folded and is no longer around? Uh, great question through the mayor. Um, that is not information that we necessarily know. Um, we do know that the developer was registered under a number company. Very good. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, uh, so I, I think I heard that um, legislatively we are required to bill taxes and utilities against units and properties. And it's so. Am I correct in that? And is it sort of imprecise in our language when we say we build a developer or a, a unit a holder or an owner taxes? We're actually always billing a property or a unit. Um, and that's sort of as far as our insight goes. And then beyond that, it's up to the owners, previous owners, whoever in that history to sort of sort out between themselves. We sort of as a matter of course to collect money from a unit we send it to the unit's address and assume that the current owner will pay for it. But am I understanding that we don't actually bill particular owners or whatever, we bill units effectively? That's sort of what the legislation says? Through the chair, yes, that's correct. We have to bill to the roll number, not an individual or corporation. Okay, thank you. And if we, um, so of the, the two options that are, it seems legislatively available to us, if we were to decide that um, uh, we would not bill any of the 96 units, um, effectively what would happen is those who had paid would get a refund, uh, but the money, you know, the utility still has a cost. And so all of Squamish, including all these unit holders in their next bill would essentially pay these fees. And so it, it, it doesn't make the fees go away. We can't make them disappear, it's that the rest of Squamish effectively has to pay for, for those fees. Is that what would happen in that scenario effectively? Through the chair, thank you for that question. That's exactly right. So the, uh, the remainder of the community would have to absorb within the utility funds that, that bill effectively, simply put. Councillor Pengill, you're good. Okay, uh, Councillor Stoner. Thank you. And just to reiterate a few things that I heard, we are not able to just parse out the 18 property owners that are affected um, by not having uh, this on their uh, tax roll. It's not the right word. Um, but there were the 18 strata unit holders that were directly affected and we have no mechanism to parse this out, correct? It's 96 or it's nothing. Through the chair, um, thank you for that question, Councillor Stoner. That's correct. So we we um, council has the option to apply to the ministry to write off the full ninety six units or um, or continue with the staff recommendation to continue with the billing. And there's no option to segment any of those out. Thank you. Um, I see Councillor Hamilton. I'm going to. Uh, have a question or two, and then we'll come back around to you. Um, so given that somewhere north of 80% of this uh, has has sort of worked and we're into this, the 20% is a, is a challenge. Um, and then of that, we've heard tonight, apparently new information that there's a potential scenario where some of that 20% is paid to the developer and that didn't flow through to us. Is that a, do we seek re like, what are our options with that? I, I haven't heard anything in your presentation that um, that clearly addresses that, uh, or is that something that um, the um, the residents need to seek remedy for outside of this this body? Through you, Mayor. Um, so that is new information. Um, if if they had paid the developer that would be up to um the owners to seek remedy there it's new information for us the the uh, de developers representative forwarded the money that they um 
that they uh, collected. So, you know, effectively not sure how that could have happened. Um, no, thank you. I, I recognize this is new, new information. Um, I'm processing it too. If there's documentation of that, is that something that we would take to developer or, or would that onus be on the, uh, on the, the owner of the, the current owner of the, the unit? As far as we understand it through, um, through you, Mayor, that would be on the onus of the, of the owner. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thanks. I think you actually answered my question. It's on the, regarding the double payment, seeking more clarity. And I just don't think there's more clarity to be had right now. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Penningill. Yeah, notwithstanding the last comment, um, I, I, when we received, we did receive some money from the developer that was for utilities. Um, was that money uh, apportioned to particular units? Like the developer gave a list of the, here's are the units that paid me and here's the unit, the money they gave me. Is that accurate? Through the chair. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, and so I'm sort of wondering at the moment is if, if we're just sort of mixing up, like the monies that were paid to that, that's that 23,000 we got and, and we aren't billing those people again. Uh, it is the other ones that were not a part of that. Um, I guess maybe that's an open question. I don't know. Sorry. Uh, yeah. When we received payment from the developer and received the list, we cross-referenced that and applied that and we're not in what we're built, what we're billing now aligns with that list, I think was the question that Councillor Pettingill was trying to formulate there. Yes, through you, Mayor, that's absolutely right. We were, we would be given the role numbers and that would be cross-referenced to our role and only the, the folks or the properties, the role numbers that didn't get, um, that weren't collected upon would have then been billed. Thank you. And would we be able to provide some level of documentation of that to someone that might have been excluded? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like how, how would, how, what cross-reference cross does the say broader community have for that, for that process? Um, just to make sure that they're covered, covered or included or in the right category here. Or is that outside of this space? And that's a fine answer too, I guess. Uh, through you, Mayor, I, I would have to look to see what our, our requirements to, to, to disclose of that and if there's any privacy issues there. Um, however, we absolutely have the information. Should we be allowed to disclose that? Then absolutely we could. I guess they could inquire if they were included and if, but the bill might be the indicator that they were not included. That's absolutely right. Councillor Hamilton and then. Yeah, sorry, now articulating this double payment question, is this an opportunity for us to perhaps invite the uh, Alice, call Ms. Collins back to, could we, could she expand upon the folks who were double charged so that we can have a clearer understanding of how that might have happened? Um, I'd like to, I understand where you're going in the and the intent there I think is admirable, but we're trying to look at the decision around whether our two choices, we're down to two choices. So are we, for, should we forgive the 96 or should we pursue, continue to forward on the, and then by continuing forward, what's implied there also is that some remedies will have to be sought to, to, fi to figure that out. But our decision is, do we set aside all of them or nothing? And if you think, and I think that going deeper into the rabbit hole of the exception of the exception isn't going to get us to that, to that cause of pushing forward on the bigger, on the bigger piece. But I've, that's my thoughts at, the, at this point. Uh, respectfully, uh, moving forward with requesting somebody pay their utilities twice is very different from requesting, uh, allowing a certain portion of the population to not pay their utilities that there's a there's a line here yeah, yeah asking I, twice i think the 
if you require more information to make this particular decision, I think that uh, that if we'd be better to defer this to a, to a future meeting than than to go into this rabbit hole of new information uh, in this in this format. So, um, I would entertain that a motion to that effect if that's where you where you are. But I think that would be the best place to the best way to address this if that's where you where you are. Um, Councillor Pettingill. Well, just on that point, I, as I understand the options before us, there was nothing in either option that would cause someone to be billed by us twice in these motions. If we had accidentally billed someone twice over and above this, we would correct that. And if a developer had charged someone and not forwarded, they would have remedies um, through the courts or civil action, I presume, to deal with that. Uh, but our choice here, one way or the other, does not result sort of at the end of the day in a in a in a double billing by us. Is that correct? That's my understanding. It's, I'm seeing nods from from staff. So in general that's that's correct. And we Councillor Greenlaw and Councillor Stoner. If we were to choose to not collect the utilities, is there any insurance recourse that we have? Like do we have any financial back backing as a municipality? No. The legislation, it's the legislative requirement is our uh, insurance backstop as to what we can and cannot do um, in my assessment. And I'm seeing nods at the at the table as well. Uh, Councillor Stoner. Thank you to the chair. Um, I'm wondering if there's any way that we can, if we were to pursue with recovering the utilities, um, if there's any way that we can provide some leeway to folks on the payment schedule. Um, in the legislative framework that we're operating under. Through the chair, we don't have that option. As of January 1st, interest charges do have to start legislatively. Just on, on that point, I understand the, um, the um, interest would start to incur. Do we have some leeway around whatever future actions would be if, if just to take the hypothetical that they're going to the um, the current owners need to pursue some sort of recourse to have that to have that address. Like, do we have some leeway in our collection policy or some other piece down the road? I understand that first trigger is January one, but um, is there something else in there or uh, nothing of substance? Through the chair, no, we don't have any any options for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Council, I think we've, uh, we need to move towards a decision here. So I'd love to entertain a motion. Councillor Stoner. I'd like to move the staff recommendation, please. Okay, and that's seconded by Councillor French and uh, Councillor Stoner, would you like to speak to it? Okay, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you through the chair. Um, I'd like to thank staff for their presentation and for Ms. Collins for coming uh, to represent uh, some of the unit owners this evening and speaking to us about the challenges. Um, this is a really tricky situation. I think the there were a number of things that were perhaps mishaps along the way that have resulted in where we are. And legislatively, we really actually don't have many tools uh, in our toolbox to adhere or to 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 seek redress in this situation. Um, I think what um, is driving my decision at this point is the overarching need for fair and equitable tax allocation um, across the entire district. So I cannot justify redistributing the utility bills for 78 units across the entire district um, to provide relief for 18 folks. Um, so that is the challenging decision that is before us uh, at this time, but I think the legislation is quite clear in terms of what we're required to do. Um, and I am I appreciate that this is causing hardship uh, for some members in our community, but I just don't see a clearer way for us to move forward at this point than uh, what the staff recommendation is here this evening. Um, so. With a bit of a heavy heart, I'm putting this motion on the floor because I think it's the fairest way across the district uh, to uh, to allocate our utility and tax allocations. 
Thank you. Councillor French. Thanks, Chair. And yes, my heart is heavy as well in seconding this motion. It's a, an unfortunate situation. And while I'm supporting the staff recommendation, I do have empathy for the homeowners who really are being asked to pay for a service that someone else used. And uh, I, I, I would hope that the impacted residents will come together and strategize and figure out amongst themselves what actions there are for them to take. Um, but at this point, I, I see this as where we're at. I support the motion. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Hamilton? Um, I think it is with an equally heavy heart that I s going to speak, uh, against this motion. Um, I understand our legis. I believe I understand, um, what staff has reported as our legislative requirements. Um, but the, uh, idea that, uh, we can give uh tax certificates we can issue tax certificates um erroneously and then uh, people purchase property based on those erroneous tax certificates um i think that if we look at uh, what it means to be accountable to our mistakes uh, this is an expensive mistake uh, but it's ours uh, and accountability, whether it's a legislative requirement or not, accountability means owning your mistakes. And I think it seems to me like issuing tax certificate, incorrect tax certificates was a mistake on the district's part. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Greenlaw and then Anderson. I'm in agreement with Councillor Hamilton. I, I do feel like there is a responsibility on behalf of, di of the district for issuing um, incorrect utility bills to the participants. Thanks. Oh, Councillor Anderson, go ahead. Speaking in support of the of the motion, I will only just add that there has we have been uh, informed of certain communications and information tracking system issues, and I think that uh, I trust that the staff are addressing these and that proper due diligence is being undertaken by our staff. I just thought that this should be noted that we uh, and the Tempest software system and its implementation um, just to ensure that uh, some aspects of this story won't be repeated on our end to, on our end and we're taking due diligence steps in that regard thank you uh go ahead councillor penningill thanks i will support the motion on the floor um it is challenging um there may have been some uh errors in our um uh, certificates however the um utilities were provided and it's it's really frustrating because legislatively we are so constrained in terms of what we can versus must versus can't do and and so the option of billing the rest of the community and this is a subset of people not the whole building that had the certificates um it is incredibly frustrating that we don't have a mechanism which from the province which permits us to uh, address just where the certificates are because that would be my inclination um, but because then addressing the certificates opens uh, we then have to have the community pay the utility bills for all 96 units uh, to address just a small subset of certificates uh, is really challenging and so um i i think um on on balance i, I will support the motion i, I may um suggest a, a follow-on motion afterwards though thank you i'll be su i'll be supporting the motion i i find it I find I found this one really challenging. There was there was um, a combination of uh, 
of circumstances that led us to to be here. Um, I think the um, the developer, uh, although we don't have uh, recourse to collect from, bears some responsibility in in this, given that they did have those those notices sent to them for the over for the overall. So, um, but I can't see. Um, On, and I do believe that the uh, the folks that, uh, or at least one that we know of, perhaps there's more that uh, if they paid the developer and they weren't given credit for that in our system, that there's uh, recourse for them through through the de through the developer. But we don't have, uh, as as staff have outlined, we don't have the legislative tools to to do uh, that task uh, in this um, as this body. So I. I also think that the the vast majority of the uh, of of the building aren't in this situation. And then, as we step back further into the community, putting um, that entire um, uh, the entire credits, I guess, uh, um, back, having to refund the entire rest of the of the development to as our uh, only possible remedy with this doesn't seem equitable for the entire community either. So um, this is a hard um, decision and I wish that uh, we had more tools available to us to handle the nuances of some of these, uh, of of this uh, discussion and, uh, um, but unfortunately we do not. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'll call the question. Uh, all in favor? Uh, opposed? Councillor Hamilton and Greenlaw oppose. Motion carries. Thank you to staff. Uh, yes, Councillor Penningill. Yeah, I, I don't know if we need a resolution for this or if I just, uh, I'd like to flag this for um, when we discuss our UBCM resolutions as, as something we may want to bring forward to the province in terms of a, a mechanism to better deal with it. It's a, an unusual situation, but one where I think better tools would be uh, worthwhile. And so I'm not sure if um, we need a resolution to flag this for that discussion, or we can just sort of note that uh, for agenda planning. So for advocacy tracking um, staff that's been looking after that, I don't think it requires uh, a motion. We'll just, we'll add that there. Is that your understanding, Ms. Arthur? So I just want to make sure we get this. I don't want this piece to get lost. A motion's always best. Okay, when in doubt, make a motion. So I'll move that um, we uh, flag this item for follow-up during our UBCM advocacy discussions. Thank you. I'll second that. Um, oh, sorry. I see Councillor Stoner. Would you like to s speak to this or return a second? I'm trying to get clarity on the motion because it's refer this. Oh, this. this. Uh, sorry. What are we referring? Thank you. Yes, we could be clearer I, than that. I just see the list come up and it just says, we referred this. Thank you. Good catch. Yeah. So uh, uh, that we refer the the issue of um, addressing uh, utility and taxation billing errors to our next LMLGA and or UBCM advocacy discussion. Okay. And I'll I will still second that. Discussion on this point. I think the purpose for this is evident with our discussion we've already had here uh, tonight. So, seeing no hands, I will call the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest that I'm going to suggest it's time to uh, take a little a little stretch. So, let's do. Uh, it's been two hours. So. Um, but to keep us on track, let's do, we'll come back at quarter after. We'll take a break. Thank you. And we're back from recess. So now... Um, we're back to item nine bylaws and the first up is first and sec for first and second reading is district of commerce zoning bylaw number 20, uh, 
two to zero zero 2011 uh, amendment bylaw for three seven seven zero seven second avenue i'll turn over to staff for the presentation Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Rish Prahalad, Planner with the Community Planning Department. Tonight, I will be presenting a rezoning application at 37707 Second Ave for consideration of first and second reading. The subject property is a flat 6,000 square feet lot located in the southern end of Second Ave in the downtown south neighborhood and is an undeveloped parcel. The property is zoned I-1 light industrial and the OCP land use designation is mixed employment. Neighboring properties are also zoned I-1 light industrial with a handful of parcels, comprehensive development zones. At the July 12th, 2022 Committee of the Whole meeting, Council provided comments on the proposed rezoning application Staff's summary of Council's comments include support expressed for the proposed uses, including rooftop use, concerns expressed for reduction in parking requirements without utilizing cash in lieu of parking provision option with a potential $120,000 loss in parking in lieu fees, support expressed for collecting cash in lieu for reducing parking, and some concerns expressed regarding bike parking proposed at the rooftop. This application seeks to rezone the subject property from I-1 light industrial to a comprehensive development zone 104 to facilitate the development of a three-story commercial and employment building. The CD-104 zone is based off the existing MUD-2 zone found in the downtown south neighborhood. The zone allows for a, mix, for a mix of employment uses. No residential uses are proposed. The development includes 10,000 square feet of employment space spread over three floors with 3,500 square feet of outdoor amenity space on the rooftop patio. The following table highlights the proposed zoning metrics. Council should note that I initially attached the wrong bylaw. However, the bylaw has been updated to reflect the uses that planning wants to see in this development. These are the same uses that were proposed, that were proposed at the committee the whole meeting. The proposed building height in the CD-104 zone is 15.6 meters, which is consistent with the four-story buildings in the downtown south neighborhood. Council should note that the building meets the maximum FAR of 1.7 and the additional height is to allow for architectural feature for the rooftop patio. This project falls under our DPA 3 and DPA 7 guidelines, which require a continuous functional overhead weather protection along the sides of the building, abutting public right of ways and entrances. Parking will be accessed off the, off the lane between 2nd and 3rd Ave. The parking stalls are broken down into eight small car stalls, two accessible stalls, and two motorcycle stalls, which count as one parking stall for a total of, a, for a total of 11 stalls. Tandem parking is allowed downtown with the understanding that the tandem spaces will be given to the same employer so that they can work out a parking agreement between its employees. Currently there is no policy around ten, ten currently there is no policy around combined tandem and accessible parking. The, applic the applicant is providing two accessible stalls where the zoning bylaw only requires one. Parking design details such as access to will be reviewed at the development permit stage. The proponent has committed to providing two level two chargers that can deliver a minimum of 3.3 kilowatts of power. Our zoning bylaw requires 10% of the required off street parking spaces in commercial developments to provide level two charging, which this project meets. 
Currently, seven Class A bike stalls will be provided along with 12 Class B stalls. The Class A bicycle parking spaces will be provided within the individual employment units in compliance with Section 41.9E with the final allocation determined at the development permit stage. Section 41.9C speaks to the Class B design criteria, including how large spaces should be. During the Community of the Whole meeting, Council made a comment about the elevator being able to fit a cargo bike, which was relayed to the applicant, who will take that into account during the procurement of the elevator at the development permit stage. The proponent will also be providing the full amount in cash and lieu fees of $240,000. Staff recommend that the zoning bylaw amendment be given first and second reading and that a public hearing be scheduled for January 24th, 2023 at 6 p.m. at Municipal Hall. Alternatively, Council could recommend that the zoning bylaw, but that the zoning amendment bylaw be given first reading and that staff work with the applicant to resolve the issues raised by Council before bringing the amendment bylaw for second reading or that the zoning bylaw amendment be referred back to staff for further review. Thank you, at this time I welcome any comments or questions. Thank you. Council, questions? Councilor Penningill, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, appreciate the clarification that only one accessible spot is required. Um, have we had any conversations or do we know if when they're oriented t in a tandem uh, way that even one of the spots, either one is, is functional or, you know, having to get by an extra vehicle, does that sort of make sort of neither of them useful as, as accessible or, or have we had an opportunity to find that out or, and I guess, uh, is this a time to ask about that or would this be at DPA stage where we generally address that sort of thing? Uh, through the mayor. So, so the applicant has provided a conceptual parking plan. Um, the details and the final arrangement of the parking will be determined at the development permit stage. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll keep going with a couple of questions then until uh, I'm told to stop. Um, uh, so, and I understand they're just architectural drawings, but when I look at the front of the building there, it looks like there's walls jutting out and three class B spots per sort of alcove that's created, um, which looks quite cramped. Um, and then from the drawing, it's not clear if there's room for an overhang, which I believe is an expectation or in the DPA guidelines, um, and because of the walls and the bikes, you won't be able to walk sort of under any kind of overhang, it seems. Now, I understand these are just drawings. Um, it's not necessarily what we're approving in the zoning bylaw. I guess what I'm trying to understand, though, in staff's perspective, is there, with all of this stuff on that space, um, the 12 spots, and, and uh, is it feasible that they could come up with a way to meet our DPA or, or you know, I guess... It, I, my concern is that we would approve the zoning bylaw and say that's okay, but you just couldn't feasibly do uh, something consistent with our DPA guidelines. And it's just sort of when I look at the architectural drawings, it makes me wonder like how f are we so cramped? And I guess thinking about the tandem parking as well, is there so much stuff trying to go on there that when we get to DPA stage, we're going to be like, this just is inconsistent with a number of guidelines or, um, is that something we, we should be trying to grapple with now or that's DP meetings problem? Uh, through the mayor, that is a, a DP stage question. Um, we are going through a streetscape, streetscapes design um, for second Ave. However, it's very, it's in it's very early stages. So we're still deciding between whether we would want sidewalks or like more of a one earth design in this part of town. Thank you. Councillor Petty, or sorry, Councillor Storer. Thank you. Through the chair, can I just confirm uh, that you mentioned that we don't we don't have any policy on tandem parking stalls? Is that correct? 
that this meets the guideline and that's sufficient. So are you speaking to the um, accessible stalls or in general? Just for just clarity. in general. So, so all of the parking stalls are shown as kind of tandem. Uh, we, we don't have any policy that speaks to the functionality of that. Um, through you, Mayor, um, I can uh, answer this question. So we, our zoning bylaw has a few references to tandem parking, and uh, it, in some cases, in some zones, it will dictate whether you can or cannot do tandem parking. More specifically, it says where you cannot do tandem parking. Um, given this is a pretty small lot uh, with commercial development on it, um, we are not recommending that we um, dictate in this case how the tandem how the parking gets ranged. The applicants will have to show at DP stage that it's all functional, um, and there might be covenants that go along with it. You know that secure that require the tandem spots to be connected to the same uh, commercial unit. Um, but because it's a small development uh, and it's at a rezoning stage, uh, we're not recommending to uh, put any conditions on that at this point. Okay, and we can secure a covenant at DP. We don't need to do that at rezoning. Um, that's correct. Yes, it would. We would have to be. Um, you know, we that that is the stage where we ask the applicants to prove the functionality of of the parking arrangement and and how the uh, traffic is going to move on the site. Okay, uh, thank you. That's it for now, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Greenlaw. I was just wondering if there are any estimates as to how many employees would be in this building. Um, currently, the applicant hasn't spoken to any businesses or tenants, so there's there's no estimate on how many people that can be employed in this building. I, I ask because I'm just I'm concerned about the 19 stalls required. And then the 11 proposed and the majority of them being tandem and the acceptance of cash in lieu of the parking spots, given, uh, the pending parking situation in Squamish. That is something, uh, information that we could bring forward at the public hearing. Um, we often on, on larger, uh, developments that, uh, we're trying to balance commercial with residential. Development, we often generate um, kind of, there's a, a formula for calculating um, employees by type of use. Uh, so we, that's something that we could generate and uh, an idea of how many people would be working in the building based on the uses that are allowed. Thanks. Councillor Stoner. I remembered my second question, which was, um, Looking through the allowable uses, I noticed that we included school, and I'm just curious if staff can speak to why we included that as an allowable use in this zone. Uh, through the mayor. Um... I I uploaded a, a new bylaw. I mistakenly updated updated a, or uploaded a an old version earlier. Um, so the new version does not include schools. Could we have staff just make sure that Councillor Stoner has the the updated copy? Is that is that possible? We do have blues delivered around the around the room to that address right. that. Sorry if, if those haven't got to. No, that's all right. If I refresh my council agenda, will it come up? Does anybody know? Uh, yes, it's uh, it's updated on the council agenda. Okay. You can have, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Councillor Stoner, are you looking at the link to the SharePoint site or on Civic Web? Because it may just be on Civic Web right now. I'm on SharePoint, but I will go through Civic Web and find it. Thank you. If access to this particular piece um, is impeding your ability to make a decision, we can move to, uh, we can figure out a way to give you some time to con consume it because we have had the benefit of having that here with us. So just, I'll leave that that to you. Just let me know. Uh, Councillor Penningill. 
Um, do our, uh, forgive me, um, do our DPA guidelines, if that's the, or do we have policy that speaks to, um, uh, I can't remember what the, the name of it is, but on the pod hotel, we agreed to um, a multi-level exterior, like a uh, lift parking, essentially. Um, do we have any policy which would uh, push us towards or away from that if we get to the DPA stage and, uh, you know, sort of the architectural drawings we're seeing don't really fit within the DPA guidelines? Like, is that where we might go to or be able to go to? Or I'm just trying to look into the future a little bit, which... Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, we we weren't anticipating of doing that sort of um, analysis or securing that as a condition in this case because they're not. Um, we don't know the uses at this point. I think we'll have a bit of a better idea when we get to the DP stage of what the uses will be. Uh, but they still might change after that, you know. And what sometimes happens is certain uses are not able to go in just because they don't they can't meet the parking requirements. Um, more a variance is required, or another solution like um, what you mentioned would be required to deal with the particular uses. Through the mayor, um, this parcel is in our downtown area, which has a specific number of stalls per uh, per employment space, so it doesn't doesn't matter on the use that's that's being proposed. It's just a, a flat number, based on the employment space being provided. Okay. Um, on the subject of the parking and the ca cash in lieu, where does this sit? It, is this the maximum? Does this maximize that that, or is there room left? Is there room left there in in the policy as I'm trying to compare it against what we're being asked and what the the policy outlines? Uh, through the mayor, so currently the applicant is proposing to buy out eight stalls, um, but uh, the maximum they can buy out is eleven. Thank you. Um, what about what consideration is given, or is there anything in here that gives consideration to the? Um, the need for loading uh, space for development uh, like this. And I'm asking in relation to the back alley and the, um, or sorry, the tandem, uh, those accessible spots that are tandem and a bit of space, it sure looks a lot like a, its end use may just be a loading bay. And I wanna make sure that we, if we're providing one more accessible stall than required, we are in fact delivering that, not just space for loading. So. Where does loading fit in, in the equation thus far? Um, since this is an all employment building in, in the downtown area, the, the proposal will only need to provide one, one on street loading space, um, preferably in the, at the front of the building. Okay. Thank you. Um, the question of, uh, bike parking on the roof and then the, thus the need for the elevator to accommodate that, um, the question around cargo bikes, I think, is a great consideration. Um, do we have a do we have a definition of that as from a space standpoint? Because the elevator I see uh, is square. I don't know how many humans can fit in that fit in that elevator, but I've been in lots of elevators with lots of bikes that aren't cargo bikes, and they take up a ridiculous amount of space. So I'm not quite comfortable yet leaving that entirely to the DP phase without knowing that we have articulated what that is because that uh, requiring a different shape or uh, could really impact the the design of the overall of the overall building. If um, so, I'm just just curious what how will that be addressed at the DP phase, and do we have enough information or a definition of what that what the problem is that we'd be looking to solve there? Um, that's a great question. We we could secure something in the um land development agreement or a covenant on, on the property that requires it to meet some sort of um, standard for getting bikes to the roof. 
um, or cargo bikes. I just want to caution council that the the economics around the sort of development are questionable, questionable uh, given the construction costs and the building requirements in the district were for commercial development at step three, um, which is not the same in the lower mainland in a lot of jurisdictions uh, are still are still at step one or somewhere at step two so we're trying to um we're, we're trying to be not as rigid with this development going through this process uh because even a small change you know like a, a larger elevator could break the project um and i'm keenly aware of that because we're working through the cc uh policy review right now and we're looking at the construction costs and there they have increased considerably in the last, even in the last year, um, especially for smaller build buildings like this. Smaller buildings with low um, square footage uh, have a higher cost than larger buildings, you know, so larger buildings can accommodate bigger asks. Um, so our recommendation would be to, um, you know, leave this to the development permit stage, see if this, this development will get there. Um, and, um, you know, we could put some kind of condition that bikes, you know, you have to show how practically people are going to get their bikes to the rooftop. Um, cargo bikes, I think, are uh, could be a problem um, because obviously they're they're larger, so it would probably require a larger elevator than what would normally be. Yeah, thank you. And that, that's essentially why I was asking the the question is around um, whether we leave that there or we say that those we could say that the um, you know, that a, a cargo bike or any oversized bicycle would be downstairs. But this, to me, the, um, I'm seeing a few places down, um, particularly in our downtown where the bike parking that's provided is overwhelmed. And if, if we're scoring parking on the roof as part of the bike parking, then it needs, it needs to, it, it needs to work or people won't, won't use it. And there will be a demand for bike parking in this facility. So it's fine if if cargo bikes have a if there's a covered space down downstairs and those bigger bikes just can't go up there that's fine uh, i might be able to live with that but i don't want to make i want to make sure that we provide that clear direction that we either expect it or we don't on the roof and the bike parking that is up there needs to be uh easy to access um or it just isn't going to get used therefore we shouldn't be considering it as a uh in the scoring so that's my objective with that um and I'd be okay if there's a covered space downstairs that, that was large, appropriately set up for those cargo bikes. Um, although I do think that we're going to need to look at bicycle charging stations at some point in the future, but I won't put that on these, on these folks, but it's probably a pretty good idea to have a, a plug near the, uh, um, near your bike racks, uh, in 2022. Um, but that's a bit of an aside and doesn't come with the same expense as car chargers, but. Uh, through the mayor, I'd like to make a clarification. Uh, the the bicycle parking will no longer be provided on the rooftop. It would be spread throughout the first three floors of the building, um, so we can make a provision to make sure that there is enough space for cargo bikes on the first floor. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Accessing any floors of the building will require the the elevator. So, um, but I thank you for that clarity. And I, I'm personally comfortable with a, a covered area. Does that make it a class A? Like. I don't know, I forget how we articulate that, but a covered area that can accommodate the cargo bikes. That's, that's however we technically call that. That's what I'm looking to, to achieve. And I'm okay to, to not put that burden onto the, to the elevator for those, for those, for the reasons of Mr. Vilniscus outlined earlier. I don't know where the rest of council is on, on that. We can take a straw poll if we need, but that's Ryan. Um, council, any other questions at, at this point, Councilor Penningill? Yeah, um, if we were just to give first reading, would that uh, enable staff to come back with um, some adjustments to parking expectations? Or if we had that in mind, we would want to send this back to staff for review or um, refer this back to staff rather than give first or second reading? I think that might be a question for for us, whether we do first reading with conditions or refer back, that's a, at our discretion. Staff's recommended the two, the two readings. So, uh, I, yeah, I'm I, happy to for further comment if that's if there's more nuance to it than that. But that's my understanding. 
Um, thank you. Uh, the reason why we're recommending two readings is because we felt since the last meeting, the applicants have addressed, um, you know, the main issue that, which was cash and loo. Um, that's, that was just our perception. Um, if council once intends to change the requirements, then would normally be applied to a, a building such as this downtown to some, a specific formal requirement for parking per se, then yes, we could only do one reading because, um, you know, we're directly, um, altering the parking requirements for the zone. If council is happy to apply our general parking requirements here, maybe put some stipulations around bike parking that could go into a covenant, then you could give two readings. So those are the two choices and we could still, you know, we can still address certain things in a, in a covenant that usually comes to council at the time of adoption after the public hearing. Thank you. Councilor Pettingill, does that answer your, your concern? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm searching for a way to, I guess, get into comments before there's a motion. <laughs> I don't think there's a way to do that. So I feel like we're running out of questions time. and I am happy to entertain a motion if someone wishes to, to move one. Councillor French. I'll move the staff recommendation. And to be clear, that's two, two readings. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Anderson seconds. Uh, Councillor French, would you like to speak to it? I'm happy with where this is at after our committee of the whole discussion. Um, I just think we're getting into the weeds too deep when we talk about where cargo bikes should be parked and um, I'm ready to take this to public hearing and hear from the people. Councillor Anderson, then Councillor Penningill. This is a um, another, another project for this uh, part of town which uh, seeks to confront the challenges of the small lots. This is an important challenge for the whole of downtown. We, are, we have a great number of these uh, um, lots with a, with a number of constraints and I think that uh, staff together with the applicants have done uh, solid work so far and I'm also wishing to see this go to the next phase and I'm happy with uh, where we're at at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, I'm a bit torn on this one and I understand most of the things that I've raised and I think that I've heard around the table are things that are in theory more appropriate at DPA stage but in combination it's hard for me to envision even if it's not this particular design that a design with the amount of um, outside class B parking and the number of parking spots uh, works. Now, I, I have sort of advocated and I understand the policy about uh, this is an ideal place to look towards a, a walkable office building. And so I would, I guess I'm concerned that with the tandem, we are getting the parking count up high, but in terms of functional parking, it's not as high really is the policy looks to, uh, which I would be okay with again, with the idea that this is really a walking focused, active transit focused building. But I feel like we should just say like, then there's only gonna be five spots and they're not tandem and they're just five very functional spots and, and that's where we are. Uh, I'm concerned that, you know, just with this small footprint and everything we're trying to require into, um, still waffling, not sure how I, I want to go on this, but, um, that's where my head is at right now. Thank you. Other comments? Councillor Stoner. Thank you to the chair. I'll support the motion on the floor. Uh, I think that the proponent has done a, a good job of addressing our comments from committee of the whole in particular. Uh, I think they came with a fairly bold ask of trying to get away with not paying any of the cash and lieu fees. So. It's nice to see that they're offering to pay them in full this time around. Um, uh, and I think that the proposal to have 100% employment space building uh, in this in this part of downtown is really val valuable and viable. Um, there are obviously, I think, some concerns around the functionality of the tandem parking. I think if that really isn't going to fly with our community, we'll hear about it at public hearing. Um, but I don't think that uh, we'll solve it around uh, 
around the council table. I think that's something that we'll hear about from our community and we can address in DP uh, over time. Uh, so I'm happy to support this to go to public hearing uh, in here from folks on where they see this project going. Thank you. Um, I'm in support, I'll, I'm speaking in support of the motion. I, I do, my concerns around um, where the cargo bikes are gonna go is uh, twofold. One is to make sure that we don't put the onus of uh, a massive elevator on on this, although perhaps there's an oddly shaped one that will have, that could accommodate a, a length. I, I don't know, and that would be great, but if if that poses a problem, I think um, ground floor is, is fine, but those spaces, um, it is important for the actual access uh, for this building to actually function and the whole thing. And I mean, when I say function, I mean, actually justify reasonably the reduction of parking, even though they're paying cash in lieu, that the act of transportation works, that has to work. So that person that is working in that building needs to be able to seamlessly arrive there uh, in that that function and um, in a way and then they're not leave their expensive machine out uh, in the weather um, as well so I think that covered and secure on the ground floor that's large enough for cargo bikes is great uh, and is is actually um, key in in defending the uh, the cash in lieu um, policy in in general where it is an accessible place it's on it's got great um, active transportation to that uh, to that area in in my uh, assessment. So it's important that that that, that works, and it also doesn't um, uh, break the development uh, by mandating that it's uh, that it works in certain in certain places that are hard to accomplish, like with a massive elevator or something like that. So I'm um, yeah, I'm quite. Uh, I'm quite happy that they've addressed the concerns we've had uh, so far. And I look forward to hearing what the public has to has to say about this as it comes as it comes um, forward for a public hearing. Um, so, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, opposed, if any. Motion. Oh, Councillor Greenlaw opposes. Motion carries. Thank you. Are we changing uh, folks for the next item? Okay. So next up, we have a second reading of uh, a rezoning on Raven Drive. I'll let you uh, introduce the topic. Thank you, Mayor Herford. Uh, hello again. My name is Brian Daly, uh, planner with Community Planning. Uh, I am here this evening to present a rezoning application at 1005 and 1009 Raven Drive for consideration of second reading. At the June 21st, 2022 regular council meeting, council gave bylaw 2893 first reading and also limited the height of the building on block six to a maximum of 10.68 meters uh, and that is to be included as a condition in the land development agreement. The subject properties are 1.32 hectares in area and located on Raven Drive immediately south of the intersection of Cardinal Drive and Raven Drive and east of the single unit dwellings on Kingfisher Road. Neighboring properties to the north and west are zoned comprehensive development zone 38 and are de developed with single unit dwellings. Properties to the south and east are zoned rural residential one and developed with single unit dwellings. The subject properties are currently undeveloped vacant properties. 1009 Raven Drive is almost entirely covered by BC Hydro right of way. So rezoning application seeks to rezone the subject properties from RL1 to comprehensive development zone 103 to facilitate the development of 35 townhomes and an agricultural area under the BC Hydro right of way. The proposal includes 35 townhomes with a maximum gross floor area of 4,859 square meters. To differentiate the unit mix, the, apl the applicant has committed to a total of five two bedroom units and 33 bedroom units. Units will range in size from 1,100 square feet to 1,500 square feet, consistent with the base density in the Loggers East neighborhood plan. The applicant has committed to a maximum size of 1,300 square feet for the two, for the two bedroom units 
though most of these units will likely be smaller than the maximum size. This application is not seeking any density bonus options, though it would qualify for the 15% bonus for public open space for providing the agricultural area and playground, and the 20% bonus for rental housing for, secure, for securing two units as affordable rental housing. Parking meets the requirements of the zoning bylaw. 33 of the units will have two enclosed tandem parking spaces within a garage and a surface parking stall outside of the garage. Two of the units will have two enclosed side-by-side -side parking spaces within a garage and a surface parking stall in front of the garage. Nine visitor parking stalls will be provided, which meets the requirements of the zoning bylaw. The applicant is also proposing an additional 10 visitor parking stalls for the agricultural area. The proposed building height is 11.3 meters, which is 0.62 meters taller than the allowable height in the current RL1 zoning and 2.3 meters taller than the CD38 zoning on the adjacent properties. The building height will allow for the garage in each unit to have a 2.25 meter tall garage door, which can accommodate a full-size pickup truck. The building height of block six, which is the building along uh, Raven Drive adjacent to the single unit dwelling, will be limited to 10.68 meters in the land development agreement as directed by council at first reading. A six meter front setback is consistent with the adjacent CD38 properties. The proposed side yard setback along the western property line is 3.96 meters, which is 0.60 meters less than the typical 4.57 meter setback in multiple unit residential zones. The rear setback is 4.8 meters. Staff are supportive of the reduced side and rear yard setbacks given the majority of the, the west side of the property is adjacent to a stormwater detention pond that is between the single unit dwellings on Kingfisher Road and the subject property and the site constraints uh, due to the BC Hydro right of way. A zero meter east side setback is included to facilitate the subdivision of the proposed agriculture area and park and to ensure there is no conflicts with structures required for farm operations. This application is proposing 2,500 square meters of common agricultural space for the purpose of food production. A playground with picnic tables and a gazebo is proposed adjacent to the agricultural area along Raven Drive. A public trail will provide access to both areas. An additional trail will provide connection to the southern property line and an opportunity for a future trail connection to Finch Drive. A large stormwater detention pond is required south of the agricultural area. These areas are located within the BC Hydro right-of-way. The proposal includes dedication of the agricultural plot, accessory buildings, visitor parking and loading, and pocket park to the district for public ownership. The area, the area is proposed to be subdivided off and transferred to the district, and the district will be able to lease the area to Squamish Can for a nominal fee. Public ownership of the agricultural area would ensure security of the agriculture tenure long term. A covenant will be registered on title of the townhouse property to notify future strata owners of the agricultural operations. The pocket park is proposed to include two covered areas and a playground with a location for having good potential to service the wider neighborhood and support agriculture use. An access easement over the, par uh, over the parcel for the townhouses will be required to utilize a single access point for both parcels. This application triggers the community amenity contribution policy. The applicant has proposed the following offer, which exceeds the policy for a multifamily, residential, or mixed-use rezoning application proposing fewer than 50 units. Cash in lieu and critical amenities in the amount of $730,410. Uh, improvements to the agricultural area at an estimated cost of $160,000, and playground equipment in the community park area on site at an estimated cost of $75,000. In addition to the CAC contributions noted, uh, previously noted, the applicant is proposing the following additional amenities. Two of the townhouse units will be secured as affordable rental housing. There is no requirement to provide rental housing of any kind as part of this application as is not seeking any density bonus options available in the Loggers East neighborhood plan. That uh, five two bedroom units will be provided with a maximum unit size of 1300 square feet, a commitment that no natural gas will be provided to any of the units in the development, and a commitment to build all units to step four of the BC energy step code and that they will be built to a carbon neutral standard. Uh, the following items noted on this slide will be secured in the land development agreement. To inform the community per policy, the project was posted to the district's development showcase and a development sign has been posted on the site. There have been three comments and two requests for public information meeting received to date. 
One comment was not supportive of the proposed rezoning, stating townhouses were not consistent with the character of the neighboring single family homes. Another comment noted that there should be public notification advising the end date for requesting a public information meeting. And the final comment shared concerns about the location of the shared waste room for the development and requested that it be located elsewhere on site. So staff recommend that bylaw 2893 be given second reading and that a public hearing be scheduled for January 24th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Now that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Oh. Council, questions? I see Councillor Anderson and then Pettingill. St Councillor Stoner, yep. Uh, with respect to um, uh, one of the comments, uh, Mr. Daly, that uh, you've stated you've received, uh, I'll just cite it here. Uh, a comment noted that there should be public notification advising the end date for requesting a public information meeting. So I'm just curious as to whether we do that in our no no notices, whether we advise the public that there is an end date or of an end date for submitting uh, th that uh, request. Uh, through the mayor, that is outlined in our development uh, and project communication policy. I believe it is 20 days once after the development proposal sign is installed, the public has the opportunity to request a public information meeting. If a, re if a request is received following that date, um, it is just noted, uh, but we do not send a public notification about that. Um, the only notification that we would send out is as part of the statutory requirement for the public hearing or if there is a variance and it was a development variance permit. Thank you. Then that 20 days is stated in our policy and is available to the public. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pettingill, followed by Stoner. Thanks. Consistent with uh, some of our uh, discussion a couple weeks ago, are we able to change the language from provided to permitted or, or not provided to not permitted uh, for natural gas? Yes, uh, staff will note that. That was, that was it? Okay. Um, I mean, thank you, but that concludes your questions. Okay. Uh, Councillor Stoner. Thank you. Thank you, the chair. Uh, Mr. Daly, you mentioned that the timing of the CAC contributions will be secured at land development agreement. I'm just wondering if we've had any discussion about when the cash in lieu for the CAC policies would be provided. Is that at adoption? Through the mayor, yes, the cash in lieu would be provided prior to adoption, um, and then the other uh, the amenities regarding the agriculture improvements and the park space would be required prior to occupancy of the townhouses. Okay, um, I am excited to hear that we've gotten to the point uh, where the agricultural space will be dedicated to the district. I'm just curious if we've done any thinking around the operational implications of that for the district uh, and how we start to budget for that or when we start to budget for that through the mayor i've had preliminary uh correspondence with the real estate department um letting them know that this was uh in the works and plan to reach out to them again uh to talk about um, next steps once this project is further along um the the discussions haven't gotten that far along given that this project has just had first reading at this time fair uh it might also be helpful to get public works feedback on uh, on operational constraints or, or costs. Uh, my last question was, you mentioned a few times, Mr. Daly, that they're not pursuing the density bonus at this site. And I'm just curious if we have any ideas to why, if there's limiting factors, uh, why they actually aren't pursuing the density bonuses when they're eligible for them. Uh, through the mayor, I would be speculating at this point, but I would assume it's due to the constraints on site, given that the majority of 1009 is under a hydro right of way. Um, it would likely require a different form of housing, um, a higher density one, such as an apartment building or something like that. Uh, so the applicants have, have decided to pursue this townhouse form, which staff feel is appropriate, given that it is transitioning from an existing single family neighborhood. Thank you. Councillor Greenlaw. Thanks. Uh, I just have a couple questions about the affordable rental housing. I was wondering uh, who will actually own the properties, the houses? Through the mayor, they will be uh, maintained, owned by the developer or 
could be sold, but uh, they will, well, they would have a, a, an affordable housing agreement is reg would be registered at the development permit stage that sets the rental rates for these affordable housing units. And typically they can't be stratified as separate units, so they would have to be sold under one title. I'm not sure if the developer intends to own, own them uh, in perpetuity or if they plan to sell them with this housing agreement and covenant in place. And the uh, the rent that's charged is predetermined then and controlled? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just a couple couple questions. The there was a question around the um, the waste room, and I see from the layout that that's kind of where where it sits, and there's some reason for that. But it is in the part of the property where there isn't a large buffer between. There's a unique piece of the property where there isn't a large buffer between the um, the housing units and the existing and the existing neighborhood. So I think when we hear waste room and then and the neighbors. Uh, here waste room they think uh it's easy to think of the sort of the worst worst case scenario there but what stipulations are there around the servicing of that to make sure that this isn't something that's like a you know um a landfill that gets picked up once every six months uh adjacent to their property like is there are there some servicing stipulations are around uh what that looks like in this in this context or is it just that it needs to be provided and then the strata sorts that out uh, through you, Mayor, the strata would uh, sort out the waste service timelines. Uh, the, the district requires the waste room and designates the size of the waste room. The developer has indicated that they will try and work with BC Hydro to see if it's possible to relocate it um, either within the right of way or closer to it. Uh, but at this time, they're not certain. There, there is no certainty of whether or not that would be permitted. Um, given that they're pretty strict about what they allow under the right of ways, but they have indicated that they would be willing to relocate it if possible, but otherwise this is um, the most reasonable location for it for servicing. Thank you. I think um, the concern of the, of the neighbors, and I think um, is, is likely that it's long intervals between and that causes an issue. So I, so siting is, is important. I think there's some safety considerations around where these where these go, not and not just that it, whether they're under a power line or not. But there's other considerations, and I I wouldn't be in favor of it being at the very back of the of the development either. To the the vehicles to service, it would have to continue further in. Um, but I'm I'd like to know more a little bit about what that what that plan is. So if we're going to see this at public hearing, uh, whether it is uh, a move of the site or a commitment to the the servicing of because I think some of those concerns drop away with regular uh, with regular servicing if the move isn't isn't pop um, isn't possible um, and uh, yeah anyways that's my I'm good there uh, council any further questions before we consider is there councilor Pennigal? Uh I was going to move a resolution yep I think we're we're there go ahead so I will move the staff recommendation. Uh, with the addition of changing wording of um, no gas provided to no gas permitted. Thank you. Is there a seconder for the motion? Councillor Stoner seconds. Uh, any other discussion on this? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm actually torn about this one. I think I've, um, you know, the, the last council has heard me uh, raise concerns about the proximity to the Fortis pipeline, which What's there is already um, uh, Fortis's largest pipeline, from what I understand, in proximity to people, and something six times the size is proposed on being added. Uh, that's on Finch, but it's less than 100 meters, and I, I still am not able to get from Fortis clarity and confidence on the actual risk numbers, and from everything I read, it is quite significant. Having said that, because I have not been able to move a majority of council on this, these developments are going ahead, and, and I believe our it is our responsibility to deal with that risk level uh, through our zoning. But as we are approving these, uh, the sort of counterpoint to this is because of the um, high aspirations in the Loggers East neighborhood plan, we are seeing developments come forward, which are really paying attention to the climate crisis, which is somewhat ironic. Um, and so to the degree that developments are going forward with no gas covenants and so on, uh, if they're going forward anyways, I want to make sure that they go forward in that way. And so 
um, that's the reason why I'm supporting this. Uh, but to be frank, I am a little bit torn and I find myself waffling uh, with, with all of these developments along uh, Raven and, and Finch right now. But, um, you know, I am pleased that setting aside the Fortis piece, um, this development is, is offering some really fantastic things with the agricultural area, um, you know, the green space, uh, the affordable units. Uh, I think as a development, it is quite strong. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stoner, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, just briefly, I'll just say, I, I think that this development has come a long way since we have first seen it. Um, so I'm happy to see it go to public hearing and hear from our community about where it sits and the uh, amenities that are being proposed uh, in uh, exchange for the rezoning that is in line with the Loggers East neighborhood plan. Um, I was excited to hear that the developer or the proponent is um, in communication with the BC Hydro folks in terms of relocating that waste room. So if there is a possibility to have that information by public hearing, that would be super cool. Um, but appreciate that that might not be possible given the rate at which BC Hydro responds to folks. So I'll lay that out there for the proponent if they can accelerate those conversations, but otherwise happy to see this move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, Councillor French? Thanks, Mayor. Um, this project was well reviewed in previous meetings, and I think the developer has been responsive to council feedback um, and um, particularly highlighted tonight with um, the, the word about the potential relocation of the waste room subject to BC Hydro um, review. So this project, in my mind, is ready to go to public hearing and I look forward to hearing from those who think they'll be impacted. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Um, I'm speaking in favor of the of the motion. I think, uh, as some of my council colleagues have highlighted, the this project has uh, evolved um, throughout the process, and I'm I'm quite happy with where with where we are at this point. Um, and they've acknowledged that uh, that uh, that there's potential work to be done with regards to relocating the waste room. I made some suggestions earlier around. Uh, around perhaps uh, stipulating some management for that, uh, which might make the location a less of a less of an issue. I don't know how possible that that concept is. Um, but uh, the agricultural piece of this, I think, is is actually quite remarkable and I'm happy to see the affordable units in there, as well as the mix of um, uh, of unit types uh, overall, I thought was uh, was great. So um, Looking forward to seeing what the public uh, thinks of this. I'm happy to to support it uh, through to that to that step. So with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. So we've got one adoption piece before. Uh, before you can sit there, it's okay, but we won't expect, I don't think we have anyone presenting to this, but under adoptions, we've got digital squamish fees and charges bylaw, um, amendment bylaw relating to utility fees. Um, so that's number 2942-2022. Could I have someone move adoption? Councillor French moves. Councillor Penningill seconds. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor French? Nope. Uh, okay. Uh, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? The motion carries unanimously. And now, see how we bought you just enough time to get your presentation, almost enough time to get your presentation up. Next, I'll invite our uh, real estate team to present on a um, on some work happening up at the up at the airport. Over to you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Nav Triplett, and I'm joined by Chantal Milan and Neil Plum from the real estate department. We are here to obtain council endorsement for two airport safety projects to be included in the financial plan amendment that will come forward to council in the spring of 2023, as well as to submit a grant application for to support funding for these two projects. So back in June 2022, council adopted the airport strategic plan interim recommendations report. As part of that report, there's two initiatives that were to be completed in 2022-2023 and that was the obstacle limitation survey at trimming and removal project, as well as the frangible signage 
project. Both of these projects are initiatives to help improve safety at the airport, as well as bring in us in alignment with Canadian aviation regulations. So the grant opportunity is called the BC Air Access Program. The deadline for the grant is December 22nd. Um, they are covering a minimum of 75% of project costs, so that would reduce the district cost for the two projects from around 72000 to 18000 If we do not obtain the grant funding, the project can still be funded from the airport reserve. As such, we have the two recommendations to include these two projects in the financial plan bylaw amendment, as well as to apply for the grant. And I'll turn it over to Council for any questions. Thank you. Council, questions on this? Oh, Councillor Stoner and then Councillor Pinnigal. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think this mostly makes sense to me. I guess I'm just curious from a process perspective why this wasn't caught in the original budget requests and why it's being moved to the Q1 budget amendment, which the process we try not to tweak the budget too much. So. Thank you, through Chair. I'll answer that question, seeing as I was the budget manager at the time. Um, so that was a miscommunication between myself and finance department. So um, it's something that actually the grant application helped us uncover that it had not been included in the, in the process going forward. So it was fortunate that that came up, but we need to include it in the budget regardless. So that's why we're here tonight. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, I'll actually move both uh, both recommendations. Is there a seconder? Councillor Hamilton, um, I'll speak to it briefly. Um, I, I think this is uh, this is this is important work. And I was happy to see it. Uh, the sort of the the catch and the uh, funding opportunity that triggered it. Those are both uh, both positive. So I think uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this implemented, and I think it's a very appropriate step. Um, any other comments for you? With that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. Next item is the uh, under community planning and sustainability, uh, Jimmy Jimmy Judd Slew Dyke Upgrade grants support do we have the staff for that or the mr rolston oh there he is hello mr rolston good evening I will, I will turn it over to you thank you for joining us thank you uh good evening mayor and council i'm david rolston the acting director of engineering for the district of squamish uh here tonight seeking council resolution supporting a grant application for a squamish river dike upgrade at upper jimmy jimmy judd slough through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Uh, just for some quick background context, Council has already actually passed a motion on September 20th supporting this grant application, uh, which was submitted in October. Uh, in the review of our grant application, the grant administrator, Emergency Management BC, has requested that some additional details be included in the Council motion. Uh, specifically outlining the district's commitment to providing our share of funds. Uh, as a brief overview of the grants and the project, uh, this grant opportunity will provide up to 73% of project costs and local governments are responsible for the remaining 27%. And this intake will provide $81.8 million across BC. Projects need to be capable of starting by October, 2024 and completed no later than March of 2027. So the project we're applying for has been identified in the integrated flood hazard management plan and was identified as the best project uh, given the, the tight grant timelines. Uh, the total cost of the project is estimated at $5.4 million and the district would be responsible for providing 1.4 million of that. Uh, the municipal funding component is currently included in the district's five-year financial plan. And so this grant doesn't commit the district to any additional costs beyond what we've already planned for. Uh, the re recommendation is that di the district of Squamish submit an application for grant funding for Squamish River dike upgrades 
uh, Albert Jimmy Jimmy Judd Slew through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Green Infrastructure, Adaptation, Resilience and Disaster Mit Mitigation Substream, and commit to providing municipal funding for the district share of costs in the amount of $1,446,000 and 581. So thank you. I'll hand it back to uh, the chair for any questions or discussion. Thank you. Council questions? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, uh, and just a, a reminder, um, it, if we weren't successful in the grant, um, we would be proceeding, like we, we know we have the funds, um, but we would be proceeding. This is a project we have to do regardless. And, and so it, it's not a concern that um, about it bumping other projects that's in the plan. We need to do it anyways. It, it's sort of critically identified in the flood hazard management plan. Through the mayor, uh, it is a project that we will proceed with. It's possible that we would shuffle priorities if we weren't successful with this grant. Uh, one of the reasons why we're applying for this project is, is simply because of the tight timelines. Uh, there may be some other projects that we, uh, that, that we pursue um, if, if we weren't successful with this grant, that, uh, particularly near the Eagle viewing area where uh, the, the priority may be higher, but um, we, we aren't in a position at this point due to some other project complexities. So uh, we're continuing to advance that work and that, that probably is the next highest priority. So uh, this is really viewed as kind of an opportunistic um, grant and quite simple uh, and, and able to achieve the, the tight grant timeline. So that's, that's the reason why we're applying for this particular project. Thank you. Council, any other questions? Anyone else have questions on this? before I venture one of my own. Okay, um, thank you. I, I think I have it that the um, there's not a budget amendment for this at all. They, the, it's just to clarify for the, uh, the, the granting organization that we are committing that, not just that there's already funds in the budget for it. Is that, is that a, a rough assessment? Make sure I'm in the right spot. That's correct. Uh, no budget amendment is required. It's simply a clarification for for the grant administrator, just confirming that we we are committing these funds if we're successful at the grant. Okay, thank you. Council, would someone like to make a motion? Councilor Stoner moves. Uh, Councilor Greenlaw seconds. Uh, any other comments? Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, staff for highlighting this this opportunity to. Uh, to pounce on uh, on something to do something with someone else's money, which is uh, extremely helpful. So thank you for that. And I hope we're successful. And with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Councilor Penningill is not putting his hand up, but I know he's in favor. There we go. Unanimous. Um, thank you so much. Motion carries. Thank and you. now we're on to Provincial uh, Destination Development Fund conversation. And we've got... I'll turn it over to staff to present. Good evening, Council. My name is Kate Mulligan, Economic Development Officer for the District of Squamish, and I'm joined by General Manager Gary Buxton. I'm here to request that Council consider two resolutions related to an application to the province's Destination Development Fund. The Ministry of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport announced a new Provincial Destination Development Fund on November 10th, uh, which provides one-time grants to support the development and rejuvenize, rejuvenation of tourism infrastructure, assets and experiences. Uh, the fund's Activate Stream supports projects that build, repair or rejuvenate physical tourism structures, amenities and experiences to support visitors and benefit communities. All projects in the stream must be shovel ready. The application deadline is December 7th, which is tomorrow. Eligible applicants can receive a one-time 100% funded provincial grant towards projects which demonstrate alignment to fund goals. Staff propose applying through an expression of interest process for funds to A, meet any budget shortfall for current plan works to the Adventure Centre, if applicable, and B, expand the revitalization scope to include items that were removed due to limited funding at the time. As such, the resolutions for Council's consideration are that the District of Squamish authorize and submit a, 
expression of interest to the Provincial Destination Development Fund for revitalization of the Squamish Adventure Centre up to an amount of $1 million, and that the District of Squamish authorize and submit an application to the Destination Development Fund for up to a $1 million for revitalization of the Squamish Adventure Centre should the initial expression of interest be shortlisted. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Council, questions? Councilor Hamilton, go ahead. Uh, thanks. This uh, also looks like a great opportunity to potentially spend other people's money. Um, <clears throat> given the very, very short timeline, um, is there any possibility for a scope change to the plans to allow for... So let me just step back a moment. I've always found it interesting that our regional transport comes into the Squamish Adventure Centre. That's where all the buses coming to and from Whistler and Vancouver go. But BC Transit does not go there, leading people off a bus to, to walking somewhere. Is there any possibility of creating a space so that BC Transit can have a space if that ever becomes a spot, a stop for BC Transit in the future? Sorry, through the chair, Pro probably not, no. Um, we're reasonably advanced on the building plans to the point that would be very that would be very difficult. It's probably not consistent with the with the purpose of the grant anyway, and I don't think we've even decided where we want regional transit stops anyway. So on all three, it's sort of a bit of a a, a bit of a very ambiguous to try and jam that in. So. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pettengill, then Greenlaw. Yeah, my, my understanding had been that typically you're not able to combine grants, um, and maybe that's wrong, but, and I'm glad uh, if that's wrong or if, uh, you know, I don't know. I guess where I'm, I'm wondering, is this a bit of a special case or uh, is are things heading in a direction where we can start to more, more often start combining grants or? or... Through the chair. Uh, this fund uh, doesn't have any um, uh, specifics in terms of uh, restriction around um, completing another grant application for the center. Um, it would be a separate grant application, which would complete separate works, um, not under both grants. So each one would be built onto the previous works. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Greenlaw. Thanks. Um, could you please speak to um, your proposal for opening up the event space and dismantling the auditorium? I, I just have concerns because this is one of the few gathering places we have in auditoriums that we have in the city or in the municipality. Thanks. Um, I don't know that now is the time and place to sort of get into dissecting that, that project. Um, we, we simply need to make a grant application. Um, I mean, the, have the designs been here previously? Go ahead. <laughs> um, through the chair. Um, council was presented with um, a series of improvements that were contemplated for the center, which was in, um, endorsed in September 28th, 2021. I believe, um, at which point uh, work started um, in terms of the design and planning. Um, and this was under the original grant that was received for a total of $700,000. So there are design schematics um, that uh, are now complete um, and available um, and which detail out the interior design um, as well as um, uh, contemplate uh, future aspects of design for the exterior of the building, including the theater space. Um, an event space. So that that was uh, presented in September 28, 2021, the, the design concepts to Council. I believe it was September 28th. I may have that date wrong. Thanks. And I think worth mentioning at that time, because I was present there, is an aim towards making it even more functional rather than it eliminating just a, it's a, it's an improvement. It's an improvement. Um, but I, I share your concerns. Um, the any other questions uh on this subject oh sorry councillor stoner go ahead 
I was just going to move the staff recommendations. So I just saw uh, Councillor Greenlaw's hand uh, come up. So I'll just, before we do that, I'll just go back to her just to make sure. Sorry, I just wanted to, because um, I'm pretty new to all this. Um, it, will this be, this this list of uh, the revitalizations, will this be kind of set in stone? This will be what we use the grant money for? Or is there any flexibility in that once the, you know, presumably once the grant money is received? Um, through through the chair, um, at this point, uh, we are working uh, with Tourism Squamish to define elements that will be um, as part of this uh, particular grant application. The expression of interest is still rather um, vague at this point in terms of the actual uh, items. Uh, and once we would be shortlisted, at that point, we would need to submit the design schematics and all of the detail. Um, but we do have a fairly... Uh, solid understanding of uh, between tourism squamish and the district what items have been identified uh, for potential under this grant which in are focused uh, predominantly on the exterior of the building thanks okay uh Kelser stoner i had one quick question actually i saw <laughs> uh in the list there's the component of increasing power but the other key issue that we've talked about was increasing fiber and I didn't see that in the list I just miss it or is that not eligible so internet fiber through the chair um, so the list uh, I think uh, that's being referred to is in the appendix those were items that um, so there's one list uh, of items that were originally um, scoped at a class D estimate um, and were used to complete the designs and the tendering for process. Um, there are um, the budget um, for the Adventure Center right now, the actual cost exceeds the available budget. So we'll be looking at what items, um, if we have any challenges completing those items, how we address those as part of the new grant application. Additionally, there was another list that was supplied, which were items that were contemplated uh, for um, upgrades to the center, but weren't brought forward to council um, because at that point we realized uh, they exceeded the scope of the, exceeded the budget um, that was available to us. Um, so those items will be considered um, also through a discovery process that we've um, completed with Tourism Squamish and the Chamber of Commerce um, and also our internal staff to look at what the needs are for the building. Those, those improvements will be considered alongside these other um, improvements that we are uh, considering at this time. So we will, um, we will be completing a series of upgrades that may include um, power provision, but that's not a certainty at this point um, and will be clarified if we move forward to a full application. Uh, in terms of fiber, uh, right now staff are working with uh, current tenants to ensure that um, we have good Wi-Fi connection throughout the building and I believe a solution. Um, I'm not sure if um, another colleague um, would like to add something to that effect, um, but right now that, that solution is being explored. Um, with uh, staff and current tenants outside of this grant. Thank you. Councillor Stoner. Staff recommendation. You Thank you for that Thank fulsome response. Thank you. And that was just to be clear, that was both uh, both portions of that. Okay, is there a seconder for the motion? Councillor Greenlaw seconds. Would you like to speak to it? Yeah, Mr. just Stoner? briefly. Thanks yeah, for finding what I call what I'd like to call a, a unicorn grant something that would cover 100% of costs. I don't think I've ever seen that from the province. Uh, so I think this is worthwhile exploring, especially given um, some of the challenges we've had with trying to advance the work with the Adventure Center. I think this is a great opportunity. So thank you to you and Tourism Squamish and others who have made this happen. Happy to support it. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Councillor Anderson. Yes, I am confident that the team working at the Adventure Center <clears throat> 
has a wish list, but it is, and it is ambitious, but it is well baked and well articulated. And it's been in the works for a couple of years now. Uh, previous council has seen some of the uh, uh, pre some of the details that uh, weren't able to be realized in the past grant, and they include, for example, potentially improving the visibility of the adventure center from the highway. And I do hope that we'll we'll be successful in this. Uh, good luck, and with the deadline tomorrow, I know that the team is working very hard to get that submission in. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing, uh, I'll, I'll just thank staff for finding this opportunity and bringing it forward, and I hope that we're uh, that we're successful in it. So, um, thank you so much. With that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. So moving through our, our list, we have no late agenda items, um, no correspondence with action required. We do have some correspondence referred from the consent agenda, I believe. Uh, was it Councillor Hamilton? Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, all right. I'd like to pull the uh, communication from Executive Director of Tourism Squamish, Leslie Weeks, regarding the uh, proposed budget, the special project, um, environmental repair and re restoration project. Um, in that letter, uh, tourism Squamish, uh, is asking, uh, for what, uh, what participation they will have in, uh, in an issue that's going to impact the areas that they rely on to attract tourists and the areas that we rely on as uh, um, community members. Um, and I think that uh, the fact that they attached a letter from over a year ago requesting a similar uh, demand for um, participation, um, I'd like to ask that this um, letter be, that council refer this letter uh, to staff for a response that articulates uh, what role the tourism Squamish is anticipated to play um, in this uh, special project. And I don't have the number written out. Okay, I think we had a uh, comments roll into a motion there. So I'm just gonna check with our, that's, which is okay. I'm just gonna check with our minute taker to see if we captured where that exactly happened. Did, did you get that all, all right? I've mostly got it, uh, that the correspondence from L Weeks, Executive Director, Tourism Squamish, be referred to staff for a response that articulates what role Tourism Squamish is intended to play in the special project. Okay, um, is there a seconder? Councillor Anderson, are you seconding that? Councillor Anderson seconds. Um, do you have any further comments on, on this? Would you like to speak to it? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, to quote from the Tourism Squamish letter, Council discussed that the opportunity for enhancements benefiting freshwater flow and tidal flushing in the upper Mamcom Blind Channel could be considered ongoing, unquote. My own hesitant support for P4 zoning in the Upper Blind Channel a couple of months ago came with the understanding, in fact, a, a message or a hint from the planning department that a project plan would be entertained in future. This, uh, my question, and I, t and I understand this to be Tourism Squamish's question, is this it, this environmental repairing restoration project? Um, where does the project, it, there's a question as to where our project that, that is before us in the budget arises from and uh, whether it doesn't really come from a strategy or a master plan or does it. Um, the project proposal does not, um, uh, it, it, what connection does it have with the, um, the discussion during the marine zoning of a project plan? So enhancing freshwater flow and tidal flushing has been uh, a vision on the part of the district and incorporated in numerous initiatives for about half a century. And uh, there's key projects, most recently installing new culverts. And um, this is all, the, the this, these projects and their potential benefits 
uh, are detailed in the Tourism Squamish letter attachments. There has been some uh, suggestion that it, these projects pose some risk to habitat and some risks to certain plantings that have been done, habitat compensation projects in the Upperland Channel. Uh, in speaking in favour of having this uh, letter referred to staff for response, I think that uh, the, there's a lot at stake in the Upper Blanc Channel and in these waterways, and I think that clarity for Tourism Squamish and other stakeholders, including naturalist organisations and neighbours of these waterways, it would be useful, uh, worthwhile. And uh, so um, the purpose of the letter, I think, is clear, uh, in tourism commerce, they're asking for what relevance uh, for our concern, our cause, uh, is there in this project. And I think this would be worthwhile for staff to offer some clarification as to the connection. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Any other comments? Councillor Stoner, did I see your hand? Yeah, go ahead. No, we're good. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll give you another opportunity to raise your hand because I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Stoner opposes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next up, we have um, uh, approval of minutes referred from the consent agenda. So I believe that was uh, Councillor French, and you pulled, we decided that it was the uh, the special business meeting uh, of November 15th was the pulled minutes, correct? That's correct. And I pulled these minutes because page three of the minutes refer to R. Chelswick addressing council. It was actually Trevor Chelswick who spoke to council about future planning to construct a new boat launch. I alerted staff to this minor error and just wanted publicly to acknowledge the change in the minutes to correct Mr. Chelswick's name. Uh, on the record and publicly. So I move to refer these minutes back to staff for that correction. Um, could we not recommend that? Um, is that the, the right course of action or can we just uh, ex amend and accept the minutes as amended? They can be approved as corrected. Approved as corrected. Let's go there instead sure. of passing it down the line. Yep. So sounds good. I'll, I'll recommend that the, uh, the, the, the correction uh, provided by Councillor French is reflected in the minutes and that they are uh, approved as corrected. Do I have a seconder? Councillor French seconds that. We'll call it. Uh, and with that, we'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, moving on now, um, do we have any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none. Uh, committee minutes and reports, nothing under that section. Any notice of motion? Um, and we've already had our, the, there's some items under the council staff in-camera announcements, but the fact that they appear on this agenda is what we, covers that off. Uh, we've already handled our item 19 is our unscheduled public attendance, which we had earlier. Um, so we're into open question period for uh, <laughs> clarification related to agenda items for anyone in the in the audience, uh, I suppose online as well. Seeing no takers on that, uh, move on to council or staff um, announcements. Council, Councilor French. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, on Tuesday, November 22nd, I wanted to share that I attended the Gentle Density Leaders Summit at uh, the Wask Center for Dialogue in Vancouver, the campus of uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, the evening event for elected officials followed a day of discussion about how to build more small housing units to address the current housing shortage across BC. Um, small accessory dwelling unit construction policies that promote building tiny homes, cottages, secondary suites, and other similar housing forms were highlighted as potential solutions to help address our current housing shortage. And uh, some good uh, bright minds are working on this, including the two District of Squamish staff members who attended the daytime events um, that brought together planning staff members from all over Metro Vancouver. And I also wanted to note uh, the Squamish Community Foundation hosted uh, Community Conversation Number 1 as part of the work the Foundation is doing to publish its next Vital Signs report. Uh, I attended with Mayor Herford 
Councillor Hamilton was there as well on Thursday, November 24th. The room was packed. Uh, more people than the organizers, I think, had expected actually turned up for the discussion, which is great. And anybody that wants to learn more about vital signs, uh, you can go to their um, the Squamish Foundation website, squamishfoundation.com. Uh, another Our Squamish Place Making Society meetup was held on Wednesday. And I attended that uh, along with Councillor Penningill. Um, the topic of the evening was placemaking and uh, great discussion, a bunch of great ideas for potential projects in Squamish were generated out of that meeting. And one more, uh, the Squamish Chamber of Commerce Business Excellence Awards were held on Thursday. Councillors Anderson and Hamilton also attended. Uh, the best um, in business were acknowledged and highlighted, and I specifically want to note that Carl Halverson was named the Citizen of the Year, one of the, the many people acknowledged um, in that evening event. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor French. Any other updates? Seeing none, um, I'll do, I'll move on to, to mine. Um, it's been it's been busy the last while, and uh, I know the next while is going to be uh, busy as well. So I'll uh, just sort of made some notes on some of the highlights. Um, late November, there was a uh, November twenty first, I believe it was a lunch. There was a lunch and learn um, opportunity put on by uh, Squamish Can uh, around ALR lands. Uh, specifically, this was targeted for our real estate community to better understand. Uh, what it means to um and what it doesn't mean uh when they're when they're dealing with a piece of ALR land and uh it was uh there was members from the um uh the province uh there as well to answer questions and uh it was a great event and there was a lot of um it was, it was very well attended and I know everybody I know I learned a lot and uh based on the on the questions uh in the room uh I think everybody there did and I think it's um so uh, thank you to everyone that's uh, involved in putting that on. Um, Councillor French's update covered the uh, Squamish Community Foundation's the, their work, um, working towards their vital signs report. And that room um, was buzzing. It was a great event. And, uh, and I, I encourage, uh, there will be future steps. And if uh, you're interested at all, they're doing really great work there. Uh, and um, it was great to see um, the level of uh, of interest from our community, um, and I look forward to seeing the next steps there. Um, and I just like to recognize the the budget information night we had last week um, was extremely well attended, despite near whiteout conditions. Uh, and um, and I really appreciate all the community, our community's continued engagement, um, not just in the in the budget process, but really in the across across the board. And this is just one example of that. So great engagement um, online, and then when we get to the, you know, having to to travel through a snowstorm to come and have a conversation about the the well being and, and the future of their community, um, it was it was, yeah, I was. Uh, Perhaps I was being a little pessimistic when I saw the snow and I know all the work went into preparing the space and I was worried we were going to get shut out and that was not the case. I think everyone had someone to talk to the or multiple people to talk to for the entirety of the event and uh, I think it really speaks to how um, how involved our, our community is and um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, that put that helped put it on and our staff and everyone that did brave the uh, <laughs> the, the winter storm to come out and and um, and say their piece. Um, and then um, this weekend, the the holiday parade downtown uh, on, on Saturday was uh, was great. I had I was invited to judge the uh, the floats, um, which was a um, harder than it sounds. It was it was quite impressive the the amount of effort that uh, that everyone that participated went to to. Uh, to come out and, and entertain the community. And um, the uh, I'm forgetting the name of the dance group that won, and I don't want to get it wrong, but they technically weren't afloat, but they had something like 70 kids 
they're all dancing with pom poms. It was incredible. So what we did is we, when we presented them the prize, we had them jump. So they were technically floating uh, whilst they received the prize. So it was, it was, uh, it was great. And then the streets were lined with, uh, with happy people to, to soak it all in. It was this really great uh, quintessential small town <laughs> experience. And I, I'm really happy to see uh, um, for all the, all the work that uh, the organizers went in, uh, did and the uh, the participants as well. That doesn't just happen. And uh, kudos to everyone involved, and uh, including our public works team for facilitating. And um, I think that concludes my update. So lots more upcoming in the as we uh, slide into the um, the holiday season. So with that, I will look for a motion to terminate. Goes to Councillor Stoner. Everyone's going to have to be faster than that if they want to score any of these. Uh, and seconded by Councillor Greenlaw. Um, all in favor? Motion carries. That's that's all. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.